Hello everybody, it's Chris Schmidt from Rocket Lasso and welcome to the what's new in 2025 video for Cinema 4D. Now, inside this video is some important information about the Rocket Fuel Driver. And if you are watching this video when it's new, we are less than two weeks away from Half Res, which is a conference in Chicago that I help run. So you should definitely get tickets to that if you haven't already. But besides that, I think we're ready to jump into the video. So I'll see you there. First up, Maxon Fuel Driver. Now, this is the big new feature of this version, and unfortunately, there's a little bit of development overlap between Rocket Lasso and Maxon. And not only overlap, but we literally called it the exact same thing. The idea is a tool that is going to take a property on an object and control it using fields. Now, there are some significant differences between the two tools, and I'm going to go over a bunch of powerful things that the Maxon field driver can do, and then we'll talk a little bit about what the Rocket Lasso field driver can uniquely do as well. Now there's a lot to cover in it, so let's jump right on into a scene file here. And you can see I've just got some simple text right here, and I want to drive some of the properties. And I'll, I'll start out with, we got horizontal spacing here. I can you know drag this property around. You can see that we can modify that. We can go negative, positive. Now, of course, in the past, we could keyframe this, but now we can use the Maxon field driver to drive it. There are a bunch of ways of getting access to it. I can right-click on an object, go to animation tags, and create a field driver tag like that. And then what you can do is grab the property and drag it directly onto the tag. Does this seem familiar? Uh, but then also, this is something that Maxon can uniquely do. You can right click on the horizontal spacing and go to field driver and say add, and that will automatically create the tag for you, which is very handy. Selecting the tag, let's go to the main first tab here. You've got the overall strength that's getting applied. We've got the evaluation mode, which is a value, color, and direction. We've got the sampling location, which typically is going to just be the axis or the object location. And then we've got our parameters tab, where you see we now have a min and max for our horizontal spacing. And finally, we have the fields tab. So nice and clean and straightforward. I like how clean this one is. How do we actually make this do something? Well, we can set a minimum value and then some sort of maximum value. So we'll crank this up to 100. And under fields, let's drop in something. I'll drop in a solid. And now you suddenly see this gets separated out. We are now driving the property via the field. So a field list typically is outputting a value from 0 to 100%. And that is now going to map from 0 to 100%, no matter what these min and max values are. Now, going into the solid, if I were to change this value, uh, it actually doesn't refresh until you let go. But if I click, you can see that we can change this to any value based on this solid, this like constant. Well, let's change this to something else. Let's delete that and maybe make a linear field. If I make the linear field pass through the object, I am now updating, and let me, let me select this and lock it. You see we've got this horizontal spacing and it's highlighted in this pink field color. If I were to grab this and slide it, you can see that that property is automatically updating. Now, of course, this is overlapping functionality with the rocket field driver, but, and it's also overlapping functionality with just basic keyframes, but things get powerful once you start adding on all the power of fields, layering them and doing things we couldn't normally do with keyframes. Let's unlock that, go into the tag itself, and let's add in a more complicated field, something like the sound field. Let's load in a sound. I'll just scrub and grab this pirate music I've got and scrub over here. And I'm going to move my probe to cover maybe just this little section right there. You should hear the audio for a moment here if I hit play. So you can see that this is now jittering and popping all over the place as driven by that music. Let me mute that so we don't need to be listening to it. Uh, you can now see that this is automatically animating any property based on this probe in any audio file. Now, in this case, we could you know shrink the probe, make it larger, modify in a lot of ways. Right now, it's really jittery, but that's where the power of fields comes in with these tools. So if I were to jump into, I know that the tag itself has things like uh, like delay or the, the decay, et cetera. But let's move into the regular field list here. And I can do something like put in a delay and a delay by default is actually set to smooth. And you can see that now it is animating. It's a lot smoother. We can lower that. So now we just take that hard edge off and now we get a little bit nicer motion on that. We can also add a decay on there. So create a decay. I'll set that up pretty high. And now as it hits a higher note, it's gonna fade down. Let me put this really high here. So now you can see as it hits a high, kind of loud frequency there, it's going to take a while to fade back down again. So you see a lot of the power comes in layering fields up and being able to control things that way. 
you probably are going to want to be able to drive multiple properties and you can, we could, for instance, say we want to control the height and I can drag that directly onto the tag. And just by dropping it on there, it's going to add it into the list of parameters. You see, we now have a min and max for the height. So I can start out smaller here. And now you can see that it's going to get both the height changing and our horizontal spacing. Now, they're actually both moving identically, which a lot of times might be exactly what you want them to do. But if you want them to be moving differently, then you need to make a separate tag. So let's remove this. And the way you remove a property is by right clicking, going to field driver and saying remove. You can also add a property by clicking add parameter and then going to these flyouts. So I can go into text and then we can move into the object properties, grab something like depth. And now we're also driving depth. Personally, I like dragging it onto the tag, but this also works and we can control the properties however we like here. So now we are modifying the depth on the object. Actually, it doesn't, is that driving the depth? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's just moving kind of uniformly to the object so you don't feel it too different. Let's try to make it more extreme. Yeah, now you can really feel those changing. But I will remove that. And what I'd like to do is drive that separately. Let's calm that back down again. I'd like to control it completely differently, a different piece of the audio. So what I can do is add a second tag. So I can right click and say animation tag, animation tag, field driver. And it made a second tag here. And I can drive that one by grabbing something like our horizontal spacing and dropping it on there. And now we can change the horizontal spacing to be driven that way. This one, I'll say, well, let's just say this is going to be the first probe. It's really important in this tool to rename everything so that you know what is being driven. In fact, it'd probably be a good idea to do something like name this one to horizontal. So I know that's driving the horizontal property. And what I can do now is drag this probe to a new location. So now we're sampling a different spot. So this should be catching the lower bits of the audio down here. And let's say that that is going to drive the horizontal here. So you can see that that is driving the horizontal all super crazy and jittery. And actually what I'd love to do is copy these two. So I can select both of those, right click and say copy. And you go into the other tag and you right click and you say paste. And now those have been brought over. So calm those down as well. And now you can see that the size, the height is changing separately than the horizontal spacing because we have two different probes going and we have two different tags going. So we can drive those things independently. Now, driving properties directly is one of the main use cases for something like this for both the rocket field driver and the Maxon field driver. But there are fancier use cases. And this is actually where I get really excited. And this is something that the Maxon field driver can uniquely do. Here I've got a simple emitter, just one of the new basic particle emitters, just emitting some particles. Now, something that was added into the previous version, which was really cool, is we can actually clone those emitters. So now there's a bunch of different emitters going. I could go and make a random and set this not to position, but instead rotation and add in a bunch of spin there. And now they've each got a random orientation, but I could also add in a noise to that and say, hey, you are very slowly spinning. And you'll see each of these is rotating uniquely. Every one of these cloners is not a copy of each other. They're each their own unique emitter. But you couldn't do the control of the color here. If we grab the random and say, hey, I'd like to change the color mode to go to the color of the effector, it doesn't do anything because it's changing like the object's color, but not a individual property in the object, which in this case is under the emitter, under properties, under color, we've got the constant color. That's what I would like to drive. So we can now do this with the max on field driver, right clicking on it. I will say field driver add and inside of the tag, because it's a color, we get a different type of parameter. In this case, we get a gradient is the only option. And we can set this from zero to 100%. So if I load in a preset, I'll just do this full color range. Now it's gonna be outputting different colors. If I start it, you'll see it's only blue, but that's because right now our field is outputting zero, which is all the way on the left. So instead we can do something like make a random field. I'll yank that out. I don't want that moving around. A random field now say randomize the sample positions. And now you can see that we're getting different colors on every single one of them. Now, uh, I'd probably increase the contrast on that. So under this, we can make a curve and usually I'll select both and kind of string that along a little bit further. So we get a little bit more contrast in there, start over and I can see we get more colors. I could go back into my random field. I could say, hey, those are gonna slowly change over time. So I will put some animation speed in there. And now you'll see that as this is animating, any one of them will slowly change their color. 
So we are able to change individual properties inside of the context of a cloner. And that is unique to the Maxon field driver. The Rocket Lasso one cannot do that. They had to change code inside of the cloner to be able to handle that. So that's a really cool feature of this one. And I really dig it. And let me show you why I really dig it in another scene file. In this scene file, I've got a cogwheel in an extrude, and I want to get a bunch of copies of it, and I want maximum variation. I want completely unique gears on every single one. So let's feed this into a cloner. I'll set the length to 20, and we only want one clone here, and I'll make a whole bunch of them along this pipe. So yeah, we want maximum variation. In a little bit, we'll talk about the blend mode, which is kind of the old way we could kind of do this, but that was only variation between two extremes, like just a, a linear transition between those. But now I can do something like go to our cogwheel, go to the teeth. I will right click on teeth and say field driver add. And now that's what we're driving. I would like to drive this parameter from, let's say five up to, let's say 24. And what do we want to drive it with? Well, let's drive it with another random field. Uh, inside of that, let's say that's all fine. Uh, I want more contrast inside the random field. I know there is a setting inside of there you can do it, but I like adding it manually with a curve. So I'll select both handles of my curve, crank up the contrast there. And it just means we're getting a little more variation out from our noise, a little bit more to the extreme. And I'll grab the random field and yank it out so it's not getting cloned as well. And to stay organized, let's name it dot teeth. So we know that that is what is being controlled there. So yeah, lots of nice variation there. And the cogwheel automatically changes the radius based on the number of teeth. But we can change that radius independently. So I want to drive a different property. And I want it to be completely separate, not correlated with this one. So if we did something in the same tag, you'd get that same like 0 to 100% on every property. And they'd be identical. That's like the blend mode. But now we can do it separately. So I will go to a different property. And by the way, you cannot right click. I want to drive pitch. If I right click on it, and say add, it's always going to add to the original tag. So instead I'll duplicate the tag. And with this one selected, you'll see that I can add a new parameter. I will manually grab the pitch radius and drop it on the second one. And I want this to go from pretty small to let's go a little bit larger than that. And let's make a duplicate of our random field in this one. We'll rename pitch. And now inside of that separate field driver tag, Let's say that this random teeth is going to be random pitch. And then all we need to do is say that this one is going to have a different random seed. So now we've got those two properties, but then they are not correlated with each other. I want to do it one more time. This time I'll go to the extrude. And this time I do want two properties to be correlated with each other. And that's going to kind of be the radius, kind of the, the certain end cap size. So in this case, I will right click on size, field driver, add. And this time, let's say that the min will be, I don't know, like 0.1, really tiny. And the max will be pretty big, like 10. So if we go to our fields and add in a random, actually, let's just make another duplicate. And this one will, we will say it is driving the radius. Close enough. And I'll drag that in. And I also wanted to make another curve. Let's crank the contrast up again. And on that radius, again, let's just do a different random seed to make sure it's working. Now, that's cool, but what's going to end up happening now is the gears are getting fatter and thinner based on the radius. Because if you increase the max radius, you can see that they get bigger as they go. So I would like to do a direct correlation between two different properties. So in this case, I can go into my object, and we've got our overall size, our offset. And I will add that to the exact same field driver. So now I'll say as the radius gets bigger, I want my maximum size to get smaller. So let's drop that down by 10. So I think down to eight. And now you can see they got thinner. Actually, we, I think we have to double that. So let's drop this down to like, I'll just drag it down until it looks visually correct. And we can go negative. So we got to be careful there. There we go, right around there. So yeah, two means that these are, all, are now actually matching each other properly. So we're actually driving two properties with this single random field. So yeah, now I've got maximum variation on these gears, which is exactly what I wanted. It's a whole rig. I could do whatever I wanted with it. I could make it editable. And actually, I haven't done that before. Let's see what happens. If I make this editable, yeah, we're going to get a whole bunch of gears that I could now do things with. So it's a way of getting variation, maybe picking out my favorite ones. But what I can do that I think is pretty cool here is I could grab all of these random fields, which are all separate. But right now, they're really a tiny noise that's getting sampled. If we start making that noise bigger, we can start getting some coherence here. 
So as I stretch it out, you're going to start seeing some uniformity in the noise, and we get these nice, soft transitions between there. But this isn't just like a blended transition between extremes. These are different properties with different seeds, each getting variation on top of them. And you can see that we can get these beautiful layouts that pretty much would have been impossible in the past. So I think that looks really cool. We give this some animation speed, hit play, and now all of those are going to be animated with all those different properties transitioning between them. So yeah, very, very fun. I love that combination. I love being able to feed the Maxon's field driver into a cloner. And let's push that just a little bit further still. Here I've got a little post-it note. So kind of this plane being deformed by a Ben deformer. Turn on a cloner, I get a bunch of copies of them. Now in the past, we've been able to transition between two different copies of the object. So let me show you the old method. If I duplicate the post-it, I'll say that this one can bend all the way up to 360 and this one will only be bent a little bit. Cool. Inside the cloner, I will say, oh, you see right now it's alternating because it's set to iterate mode. We could set it to random and now they're randomly distributed, but it's just one or the other. But we had blend mode and blend mode means it's transitioning from one shape to the other. And we could control that. It's a little bit of an obtuse workflow, but it, we've gotten away with this for years and it did work well. And that is if we add an effector like a plane effector and say, don't offset the position, but instead I want to modify the clone. I'll drag this up. Let me turn off to say, don't affect the color. So now you see it's modifying the clone. They're all back to being identical. But now in the field list, I could add in something custom like a random field here. And now you can see that we're getting a random amount of rotation on each one. But this is kind of a simple just blend between those two extremes. We couldn't add any more variation than that. But like I said, we have gotten away with this for years, so it worked well. But now we can get way fancier. Let's delete that plane and delete one of the post-its. And now I've only got the one post-it, and they're all identical. But now, and let's go from the cloner being in blend mode back to iterate. Very important. Uh, the field driver tag does not work in blend mode. On the bend, I'm going to right-click and say... Animation tag, field driver, what do I want to drive? I would like to drive the strength. So I'll drop that on there. And let's say this will go anywhere from zero all the way up to 360. Excellent. What is it going to be driven by? Well, let's make another random field. And you see now it looks very similar to that blend that we are doing. I'll increase the contrast. So add in a curve and I'll sort of uh, crank up that contrast in a soft way, get more range out of our noise. So you see we get the extreme kind of 360 and we got some that are almost completely flat. So excellent. So that's pretty much what we could do before, but now we can start adding additional variation. So this time I'm going to say, hey, what do I want to drive? Let's go to the coordinates. And I think I want to drive B here. I want to be able to spin these around differently. So let's leave that at 90 and make another tag. I'll duplicate the existing one. And what do I want to drive this time? Well, I'll just drag on B onto there. You see it defaults to 90. I'll say, I want to go 90 minus 45 and 90 plus 45. So you see now we've got all that variation on it, but right now it's kind of behaving the way the blend would work inside of the cloner, where it's just a, a, a linear transition. Essentially, it means if it's curled up a bunch, it means it's tilted on the right, and if it's very flat, it's tilted on the left. So we need to separate those out from each other, and we do that. Let me pull this random out. We do that by making a second random field. So I'll make a second one. This time I'll name this one to, I will say dot B, and we'll say that this rotation, and you see the icon actually updated to show it, is going to be driven not by that first random field, but the second one, and looks identical until we give it a different random seed. And now those are completely separate. Now how much is it's curled has nothing to do how the bend is tilted. So we're getting maximum variation on these, which is like, it's just so powerful. I'd like to add even a little bit more variation on there. So let's add one more tag. I'll duplicate this again because I want a separate seed. And I'm thinking we grab the size here. So I'll drag size on. And uh, essentially what, I, what I'd like to do is pinch these down to be tighter. So it'll go as low as one and as high as seven. So we get some long bends and some really short, sharp bends. Now I'd like a different random field here. So I'll duplicate this again. This one I will name dot size. And inside of that tag, I will say, yes, I'd like to drive this with a different random field again with a different random seed. And now that has added additional variation on top of it as well. So we get so much power just by controlling 
different parameters with different Maxon field driver tags. So maximum variation there. I could again grab all three and start cranking up the size and we could get some visual uniformity there. But again, those are all separate. They're random from each other. Uh, one last thing to put on there is we could go back to the original bend and we can do something like make a linear field and say linear field, I would like you to multiply. And now, and pull that out from the group and I'll drop it as a child here, probably name that dot bend. So now, now that I'm multiplying the bend field driver, I can grab this linear field, shrink it down a little bit here. I can grab this and multiply it on top of that property. And you can see that all of them transition in still perfectly. So this is a very hopefully clean, simplistic example, but the ability to add variation to every different copy of the clone via using the Maxon field driver, you know, that's where to me, a lot of the power is coming in. That to me is where this becomes super duper powerful. But of course you can just drive any property using fields. But that brings us to the next topic. And that is the Rocket Lasso Fuel Driver. Now, I already mentioned there was some overlapping development. Rocket Lasso has been working on this for a year and a half, but then Maxon had the same idea and they implemented it very differently and in a much more simple form where I feel like ours is significantly more powerful and it can do a lot more different things. Of course, a Maxon one works inside the cloner and it's built right in, which is very powerful. So one thing I wanna make sure is that everybody who picked up the Rocket Lasso field driver in the last month, if you are not happy that Maxon came out with one at the same time and you want a refund, we will refund the field driver tag portion of your plugin, just contact us. We wanna make sure that everybody is happy. But of course, our tool was not just the field driver tag. Our tool also included in the bundle six additional new fields. And I think that's where a lot of the value comes in. Although our field driver tag does do a lot of cool additional things that the Maxon one doesn't. And I want to go over some of those right now. Of course, I have hours and hours and hours of video going over every little detail. And I don't want to be too repetitive here. So let's do it very quickly. But one thing to mention is for anybody who did miss our launch sale, we have it on sale right now for 5% off. And you just head on over to gumroad.com slash rocket lasso and then type in rocket field driver 2025 for an extra 5% off. So having said that, let's jump into a scene file here. I've got the rocket lasso field driver logo and I'm going to right click on the timer and the way you use our plugin, once you've got it installed, you right click go to extensions and you go to the rocket field driver. What do we want to drive? Well, I want to drive, let's just say the rotation of this thing. So I'm going to go to coordinates. I'm going to grab B, the letter B here and drop it directly on the tag. And now that is what's being driven. Now you will have noticed when I made the tag, it also made a field out of the gate too. So as soon as I dropped in a parameter to animate, if I hit play, you'll see we actually do have some animation right out of the gate. So how is this happening? Clicking on the tag, conceptually similar to you know, the maximum one of the rocket lasso will have a lot of overlap in that we have a minimum value and a maximum value, but we did left and right. And now we can type in any value we want. And in the same tab, we've got our field list here. And by default, we're using one of our brand new fields, which is the rocket timer. So if I click on the timer, you're gonna see we have some additional options here. We have a start and then end time. And then how are we looping? So I could say, hey, loop only two times and I can restart. And now you see it's gonna loop loop and then it's done we could play it one time we could play infinite we could yo-yo it back and forth zero is infinite so now you can see it's gonna go forward backward forward backward let's go back to looping in addition to that we made a bunch of really fun presets here to be able to jump to it really quickly so we can do these different animations and have them all looped on top of each other just to have these quick you know presets to jump to to get to the animation you want very quickly so in this case i might want to grab this one to animate this along. And I'm gonna say cumulative. And now you're gonna see it's going to rotate and then loop and you see it continues forward. In addition to that, you see our little feedback widget here. And the very first loop, actually let's do a regular loop. You're gonna see it's looping, looping from zero to 100, zero to 100. Once we do cumulative, you're gonna see that it's going to animate up and then continue up more because now it's at 200%, 300%. Now let's have that rotate just the way it is. But I'm gonna say, I want you to only rotate from zero to 60, which is exactly one tooth of the logo. So it's rotating constantly additively and very easy to click on our timer and reanimate this to some new position and get a big pause there now. So of course the power of fields comes in in layering them on top of each other. So inside of our field list going from zero to 100%, let's say that we want to modify this. So I will modify it with a delay 
And by default, it's smoothing it out. So you can see that takes the edge off that rotation. We do a very small one. So now you can see it takes the edge off, but just a little bit. But even more fun than that is spring. So now you can see as it animates, it's going to spring, spring. We get this lovely overlapping animation. Let's jump to a new value. Of course, when it comes to any of the modifier types, they have to kind of have the frames before it to calculate. So that's why it's spun up to the correct position. But now this will just spin and rotate and you get this awesome like springing forward backward overlapping animation which is it would be very difficult to do by hand and now i'm just getting it for free automatically with this animation but field driver does a lot more than just doing a couple keyframes on there well let's clear this one out in fact why don't we start from scratch so that was the timer but if you make a brand new right click extensions field driver if you hold down alt as you create the tag it'll actually make a different one of our fields and that is the rocket noise which is a different version of the random noise with some key differences. So what do I want to drive this time? Well, this time I want to drive the position, but instead of grabbing it from the object, we have this quick link tab. And this makes it so that the most common parameters of position, rotation, and color, you can just click this button and automatically you've got your position. So let's see, I'm going to set this to be, let's go from 50. And here's one of my favorite things. We got these arrows. So I'm going to say 50, but then I'm going to copy that value down using this down arrow and then mirror it to the other side using this mirror button. So now I was able to easily copy that value from one spot to all six with just two clicks. So really like doing that. And because I made the rocket noise, and of course you can feed it in any field, we got this rocket noise, I can click on that and we can look at its properties. So now when I hit play, you can see we get this lovely drifting animation, a little bit like the vibrate tag, but the rocket noise can access all the different Cinema 4D noises, of course, and we can control the speed and we have a loop period but I really love this bias slider because you'll see a Cinema 4D noise, especially, especially like the Perlin noise, you can see that it hangs out in this middle range, like in this kind of 50%. And very rarely are we getting down to this very dark area or this very light area. So if we start increasing our bias, then this is going to modify that. Essentially, it's doing what I did with the Maxon field driver, which is make that curve. This one's a little bit more extreme. It's kind of exponential. We can keep on pushing it further. And right around 15 to 20, you're going to kind of get your Perlin noise getting this full range of motion. You can see how much more it's moving just because we're actually using that full range. I find that very useful. Uh, but you can also crank it up like all the way. You still get a little bit of a transition here. We can see how it's actually like snap, snap, snap. But we're getting to these extreme positions. So yeah, back to something like 15. Now you can see that nice drifting around nice and slow. I'll slow it down even more actually to show you another new feature that or a special feature that the rocket lasso field driver has and that is we can make a new tab and in the new tab i can say yes new tab and i want to control a second layer that gets added to the first so in this case i'm going to say i want it to wiggle 11 copy it down copy it over and now let's put in a second rocket noise this time i'll name this one mod one just keep them distinguished and i'll say that this one should travel like super fast so now you can see i've got this big slow drifting motion and on top of it this layered up jittering one. So you can keep these all separate and clean and modify as many different layers as you want to. Now, of course, you can continue layering on top of that. Like we all this jitter, but we can calm it down a little bit. Let's add in that delay. And now the smoothing is going to calm that down or sometimes even more fun, some spring. So still pretty jittery, but now you get all this lovely secondary overshoot, which I think just ends up looking more natural. Like the noise is so chaotic that it just you know, like kind of overshoots and destroys itself. Where here, the delay is like, oh, no, it was really sharp, but then it kind of wiggled into position. So I just like the way that ends up looking a lot. Now, you can also drive more than one parameter. So I can go to coordinates and hold down or click on rotation and hold down shift. And shift means add it. If you don't hold down shift, it will replace it. But hold down shift and we will add another property. And now we're rotating. I'll say do it 90 and negative 90. And actually, that's in the modifier tab. So I'll say just like 5 and 5. And let's go to the base tab and we'll say 90 and we'll copy that. So now we got this slow rotation of 90 degrees and we got this faster rotation of five degrees and we're able to layer those up on top of each other. And you can go to individual layers and say, okay, but this modifier shouldn't affect your rotation. We can just turn that one off, make multiple layers to control one parameter on one tag. I find that pretty useful. Uh, and we keep on making more modifier layers if we want to. So yeah, that's working pretty nicely. Uh, I'm actually gonna slow this down a bit. I'll grab both of these, grab the noise and say X times 0.25. Just slow it down. Yeah, not quite as fast to show you one last feature in this file. And that is if we want to change color. And I really like this. I'm gonna grab the gear and right click on it and add another rocket field driver. And this time I'm gonna do the, do the quick link of color and instantly you're gonna see that that is now animating. It took our pink color and it put it here. 
But now you'll see that we are driving the color here. And I love this workflow of doing this color all the time in like Redshift, I'll say view the user data and I can colorize my object, make one material, but colorize the object. So I could be like, this object's orange, this one's blue and I control it via just this color. So with that workflow, I can just modify these colors and let's go back over here. Now we have the mirror button still, which is fun. Do you wanna know what the opposite of this pink is? Well, apparently it's this lime green. So yeah, we add in this blue and mirror it across and now we get this red. So we can just do a nice simple transition from one color to the other. And if we go into this timer, you can see that the timer is just slowly transitioning right here. You see the transition between those two colors. But we have three different modes. The Maxon only has a gradient, but we have this simple transition from one color to another. We could also go to the gradient. This is like what the Maxon one has. We can load a preset in and I can grab any colors I like. So let me grab this full color range and I can see we're transitioning slowly, actually not too slowly, but we're transitioning through those. So I could say, you know, this type in 90, slow it down. We also have this handy button right here that I can click on this and it will match the timeline automatically. So this transition is going to be incredibly slow. You can see it is slowly changing over time, but very slowly. Let's go back to, let's say 200 and now it's animating across. So yeah, really fun that we can drive it that way. But then we also have the field list option. So I can click on that and now we can feed in multiple fields and drive it that way. So we could have our timer. Hey, actually, yeah, let's do it this way. I'll put it in this timer and I'll say, I want to do a colorful transition. We'll do a color remap of a gradient. And let's just say, yeah, we're going from black to white over time. That's great. But then I'm going to also make a rocket noise on top of it. And this one I'm going to actually, what we could say overlay and overlay might work. So yeah, we get this overlay and I'll go into the rocket noises, color remap, say it's also a gradient. And I'll set that to do a load preset and we can load in these colors. So you know, that's animating now. I might even make it super, super fast. So let's uh, crank this up to like 500. Then you see that those colors are changing quickly and we're overlaying on top of whatever our timer is doing. So you can see it's gonna start out dark and then get lighter. We could lower this time down. So you can see it's quickly transitioning there. We could say the overlay is very mild. So now you can see the colors are transitioning, but we only see like a little bit of that color overlaying on top of them. You can just click on the advanced tab and you can see what your final output is. So you can see that those colors are transitioning on top of it, going from dark to light. So the ability to use the field layer to layer up these colors via field just adds a lot of power on top of that. So closing this file down, those are some super duper basics. Here's a preset file that's included where you can see all the different options that the rocket timer has, all these different kind of looping animations, what looks like looped, what looks like yo-yo. We've also got this rocket noise, our rocket noise field. You see all the different noises driving this. I actually find myself referencing this file pretty often because like, it's, it's hard to know exactly what a noise is going to do. Like here, right here, the circled one is our default, our Perlin noise, very smooth. And all the other ones are gonna be a little bit more chaotic than that. So you get like box noise and box noise is a little bit sharper of a version of it. And then Zada, like that's pretty good. I like Zada the way that's moving. I don't use that one too often, but I could see reaching for that because I kind of like the way that pattern looks. One of my other favorites, Luca right here, you see like all the messiness that you get out of that, really fun. Uh, but then ones you might not use are like a Sema where it's like, okay, that pattern's so rough that I'm not sure when I, I would want to use it. I know maybe I'd want to use that on like a flickering light where like every once in a while it's like flicker, 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 flicker. So, you know, that could be pretty cool. So I love the way that those layer up on top of each other. And the last quick file I want to talk about is the MoGraph tree. This is also included inside of the demo files for the Rocket Lasso field driver. So we've got kind of these animated sphere leaves and we've got this keyframed camera, but the rocket field driver is adding some jitter and rotation on top of that. So you see this extra motion that we get. So maybe we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. So I'll delete that tag off so we can make it ourselves. So we'll disable all that and temporarily hide the camera. So let's focus on these leaves here. What I'd like to do is remake this color section of it. So here's the plan. I'm going to delete everything out from this color modifier including the tag, including these modifiers. And let's pull this tag off of it just so we can see just the base spheres. So I would like to colorize these. We've got a plane effector. The plane effector is set to drive the color with the fields. So inside the field list, what do we want to put? Start out with a maxon or random field. So as soon as I create that, I'll say yes, affect color. And you see it's going to be kind of like jittery all over the place because we're kind of passing through them. But let's say that the noise is really big. So I'm going to keep on scaling it up and up and up and up and make it huge. There we go. So we get kind of these solid blocks of color. And I want to make a set color, not random. So let's go into our color remap and say gradient and load a preset. 
I'm going to intentionally pick something kind of desaturated. Let's grab uh, Lucky Marshmallows. These are one of my presets. You see that we've got these uh, now shifted to these marshmallowy colors. So, okay, that's, that's fine. That's all standard cinema stuff. But now I can go and add in a custom modifier. So here's a brand new Rocket Lasso Hue, Saturation, and Brightness modifier. When I create that, it is going to enable us to, much like Photoshop, modify the colors via cranking up the saturation. So now, in spite of me getting that very desaturated kind of gradient, I'm able to remap the colors. In addition to that, we could darken it, we can brighten it up further. We can even, a feature I like is this base hue. If I turn that on, it gets rid of all whiteness, like all darkness, and now it's just the pure saturated version of that color. So that's pretty fun. So, but let's turn that back off, and I want the saturated version, so I like the way that that is looking. Then we've got the actual hue, so we can actually kind of shift the hue around and travel the entire color wheel. So I think it'd be kind of fun to animate that. So why don't we do that with a new Rocket Field Driver? So I'll right-click, say Extensions, Rocket Field Driver, and what do I want to drive? Well, I would like to drive inside of the color factor, inside of this modifier, grab the hue, and drop that on the tag. Now you see we already have this timer set up. So I'm going to say I want this to go from 0 to 100, which it is. And actually, it is pretty much just perfectly looping right there. We could say cumulative, and now it's actually going to loop around and around. The uh, hue itself, let me click on this so you can see. You see that this is unclamped, so it can keep on going around and around and around the color wheel. So you see that's animating super quick. So I'll grab my timer and say slow down. Let's do like 200 frames. That's so going to loop to 100. And you can see this is going to slow it way down, so the colors are shifting slowly. Excellent. So now let's go and move back inside of the color. And I'm going to say, use another rocket lasso modifier. Clicking on this, I'm going to make a rocket stop motion. So clicking on that, let's make it really blatant. I'm going to grab the update every, right now it's at the three, but I'm going to say 30. So what is this modifier doing? This is taking whatever value came underneath it. And it's just holding onto that value until we hit this update every, in this case, update every 30. So this is kind of doing a stop motion effect. If I drop this down to like five, you'll see them changing. It's more like pop, 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 almost like a stop motioning effect. So we're using a real extreme version by jumping to 30. We see that every once in a while it updates when we get these nice pops to a new color. So something that's pretty fun here is I could turn on index. So now they're each individually calculating and we could give them a little bit of variation here. So I'll say a variation of 10. And now as they transition, you're going to see that every one of them transitions a little offset from each other. They all kind of pause for 20 frames, but for that 10 worth of variation, 10 frames, you kind of get this pop, 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 pop. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, I love those, the way those are transitioning. I'm going to speed up the animation just a little bit. So we'll grab my timer and drop it to about half the speed, just so there's more of a contrast when they pop. And now inside of the timer, we can also do something like smooth these out. Once again, all of these cool fields combined with all the traditional Maxon ones. So I can grab a delay and then slow those down. And now they don't just pop, they'll do a smooth, oh, let's turn on color. They'll do a smooth transition between their colors. So we can make that as quick or as slow as we want. So now it's a really slow transition. But instead of them just popping from one color to another, just a little bit of smoothing. Now you see that smooth transition between them. I love layering the stuff up on top of each other. So, you know, and even here, it's like, oh, now I could add another huge saturation and brightness and say, yeah, but let's desaturate it back down a little bit. It's a little too bright. So, yeah, we just keep layering and layering and layering. Like, that's where the power comes in. So, yeah, that's uh, that's the Rocket Lasso field driver tag there. Our ability to drive any parameter, multiple parameters, multiple tabs, multiple field lists, and then combining it with these six additional fields. Uh, we didn't even get to all of them, like the field driver link tab. And we've got the weight, like there's a lot of additional ones that are there to play around with. But let's just talk about piggyback for a second on the camera. So I'm going to click on this camera and hit play. And here's just a simple keyframe animation. You see it just smoothly moving. So, you know, that's great. Now let's add a field driver on there. Rocket Lasso field driver. And I'm going to delete out the timer. And I'm going to say I want to drive the position. And I don't know how extreme we need to go. So I'll say 55 and copy it, copy it. And you'll see it kind of jumped to reset our position because our tag is completely taking over everything. But if we go under advanced and I say piggyback, it is actually going to be piggybacking off of the keyframe animation that we are on top of. So now what animation do we want to be driving this with? Well, let's grab a rocket noise and I'm going to make the speed like really fast just so we can see it. So now, yeah, do you see this secondary movement that we're getting? I'm going to go even faster just so you can really feel this jitter. 
So then you see this shake, this kind of chaotic shake on top of this keyframe animation. That's all thanks to this piggyback option in the field driver up here. So yeah, this lovely shake on top of it. So we can push that as far as we want. So let's push it at, I don't know, 155. Mirror down, copy it over. Cool, big old shake. And then we can start calming it down a little bit. Let's go and grab the delay and let's put in a spring there. So now let's do a big spring. So now it's going to be doing that motion, but you see it's really kind of calming it down a little bit, a little bit overshoot and calms it down. Let's grab another delay, stack up more than one, put a smooth on top of it, and now it's going to smooth out all that motion. We put that first delay to smooth out the initial motion. Let me show you. Turn this off. So here is pure jitter. Here is the delay calming it down. And then here's a little springiness on top of that just to get that overshoot built back in. And we're able to layer that on top of our keyframe animation. And of course, uh, the Rocket Lasso field driver is set up to bake automatically. So you can just click to bake all your keyframes. So you can send it out to render farms or people who don't happen to have the plugin. But anyway, I just wanted to cover some of the things that made the Rocket Lasso field driver special. As I said, if you already picked it up and you think that you can just get away with using the Maxon field driver, which you see it, it, it does all really cool stuff and it's really cool inside the cloner. But I do feel like, feel like our tool is a little bit more powerful and does a little bit more stuff here. But yeah, we will do a refund for that part of the tag. For everybody else, if you haven't picked up already, there is that 5% sale going on right now, the week after this video comes out. And you head on over to gumroad.com slash rocket lasso and you can pick up the rocket lasso field driver plugin bundle, which is the field driver tag and six, six new fields for Cinema 4D. And now on to force reroll. Okay, so this one's a little bit specific and maybe a little technical, but I think it makes perfect sense. And we're actually gonna spend a little time in the previous version of Cinema. So here's 2024. Now, very simple setup here. I've just got a stack of boxes just so we can kind of measure against it. And then I've got the single clone of a cube and I'm going to be animating it with this plane effector only on Y. So you can see I've actually keyframed the value here. So the only thing that's happening is this is animating up. Okay, that's all, that's all that is happening. So then I'm gonna turn on this delay effector and it's kind of the spring. So you can see that that is now springing and animating up and down. So if I were to hit play and then stop on frame 30, you can see that we're living kind of right here in the blue range. That's where it is hanging out. Now let's go ahead and render this out from frame zero. So I'll just hit render. <laughs> now if I hit play, you can see, cool, exact same thing, right around frame 30. You can see that we are right in that blue range. All right, now let's say that we are not starting at frame zero. I'm gonna go to my render settings and say, we're not gonna render until frame 30. That's where we start, 30 to 90. So. I'll even rewind right now. And we know that we should be right in the blue range at frame 30. But now let me render. It starts over and look, it wasn't up in the blue range. It was down here at the very bottom. What's going on here? Why didn't that work? Well, essentially this is what pre-rolling is. This is that Cinema 4D, when it goes to render, like internal to like the scene file that is rendering internally, it would, if you're pre-rolling, it would go and play through every single frame up until the frame that's starting, and then it starts a proper render. Now, in the past, it didn't really play through everything. It only played through things it thought it had to play through. So, like, uh, if there was, like, Expresso tags, like, the Expresso tags would calculate. But in the newest version, in the new 2025, if we jump into the, literally the exact same scene file, I will, again... We've got the delay turned on, and I'll say start at frame 30. This time, without doing anything else, back at zero, let's hit render. You see it started up in the proper location. So that is excellent. Essentially, the system's gotten a lot smarter about knowing what needs to calculate. It, what was happening is things like delay and decay and the spring effect, those were not catching the pre-roll requirements, and therefore nothing calculated on those until the frame that we get to. So it's suddenly at 30, it's like, oh, the, the spring is like, I'm, I'm still down at the beginning spot and it's trying to catch up to the location. And so this would lead to in your renders, let's say you had done that animation where you rendered from zero to 90. And then later in the day, you're like, now I'm going to render from 91 to 200. Suddenly you'd end up with these types of problems. And the only way in the past to fix it was going to be to go into your cloner, right click and add a MoGraph cache and you bake it. You bake out your MoGraph and then you could actually render it because it's all been baked out. But of course, you don't want to bake it out if you don't have to. So now in the new version of Cinema, 
there's a bunch of stuff like simulations are going to be better at catching stuff like this delay and decay effectors. Those are going to catch it. A bunch of different things are smarter, but now there is actually a new setting as well. If I go into my render settings, you'll see in Redshift and also in Physical, there's a new force free roll checkbox. If we turn that on, it is going to force cinema to not just calculate certain things. If your animation starts at 30, then it's going to be like, no, play frame zero and one and two and three. It's going to play through every single frame and then start rendering at 30. And that pretty much means everything has to be perfectly synced up. So if you're anything like me, if your scene files are similar to mine, like a render might take hours and hours and hours, but just playing from frame zero to 30, that doesn't take long. So to me, it's very safe to always have this turned on. That way you just know they're going to be correct. Now, of course, if you're if you're not starting to like frame 1000 and you've got this big particle sim, like that might take a long time. Maybe you still want to bake it out. But this is going to make it that in a lot of circumstances, you don't have to bake it out. And in fact, depending on your render farm, if you're using like a bunch of the same GPU, if the computers are very similar, there's a good chance you don't have to bake anything out and you can just say force pre-roll and all of them will successfully calculate and look the same on the proper frame. Now, if you have different hardware, or let's say the, the render farm is Max and PC, there's gonna be like slight differences in the calculation and you definitely don't wanna do it in that circumstance. Like no matter what, they're going to be different. So you would want to bake everything out in that circumstance. But pretty often, now you don't have to. Now, if you're worried about it, maybe you should do the pre-roll and you should do the baking. But in a lot of circumstances, especially like for me on one machine, I can just turn on the pre-roll and not worry about baking anymore and stuff should just work perfectly. So yeah, more of a quality of life improvement, but a very, very nice one. Next up is OCIO changes. So this is that ACES workflow, and it is something I am highly not qualified to talk about. But I'm going to do my best because this mostly seems like workflow improvements. So moving into a new scene file, if you hit Control or Command D on your keyboard, you can go to your project settings and then twirl down color management. And this is going to look very different than it did before. Going back to the previous version, you can see here's what color management looked before. We had basic and we had open color IO. So we can jump to that in the old one. But now in the new one, you're going to see that it's not just a, a switch that we set. It is a button that we push. So we're going to click this button and I'm going to switch it to aces and say, OK. And now everything's been set. You can see our view transform is set. Our thumbnails are set. Our display space. So our actual computer's display is set. Of course, you can change that if you use like different configs. These are not things I know a lot about. But in the past, there was a lot of sort of options that felt like, oh, here's an option. Maybe I should change it. A lot of those have been simplified. It's harder to mess things up. In general, things should just kind of work now. And another problem that used to happen is if you were importing assets, if you were copying and pasting things between scene files, like colors would get messed up. If you activated the ACES kind of workflow, if you, if you switched between them, it would like double convert things sometimes because there was uh, here you can see we've got this convert to OCIO. But if you converted something, imported something new, converted again, things would get like double converted. So there's a lot of ways of messing it up in the past. And now it should just be way simpler. And honestly, it was that messing up of things that stopped me from doing a lot of it. And honestly, I just don't render that often. But in addition to that, there was more interface changes as well. Things inside the materials. So in standard and physical and inside of Redshift, if you were to make a new material, Actually, let's start on the old one. Let's just make a new Redshift material. I'll pop this open. Let's search for color and make a simple color node. So now, even though I'm in what should be the ACES setup, if I were to click on my eyedropper, I'm going to just snag a color. I'll just go up here. You see, we've got these colors. If I mouse over this little pastel green, look at this like neon, look at that neon green that I'm getting right there. So those weren't translating properly between each other. But you'll see in the new version, if I do the exact same thing, double click, search for color, pop that open. And now let me grab my eyedropper and drag this over. Look at that. That little color I saw is now the color I see here, which is the color I see there. So all that stuff should just more easily translate. Anything you're importing, anything you're copying and pasting, it should hopefully just kind of work. Now, if you're the type of person who is using the ACES workflow, all this should mean a lot to you. Uh, if you're someone who's not using it, then maybe you're like me, it's just like a little bit complicated. So maybe it'd be a fun time to play around, but this is not the video to explain it. You're definitely gonna wanna go and watch a dedicated video on the workflow and everything should just be working smoother now. Uh, the last thing to mention is that there was two new render tokens added in. 
So when you go to save, if you click this little drop down, there are two brand new ones involved in it. We've got the render color space, and we've also got display color space. Those are two new tokens that you can add in to have your images named properly. On to C4D Home. Now, this is probably not going to be applicable to a lot of people, but let's move into a new scene file. And for trial users of C4D, and I wonder if they're going to do more of this in the future, but under your help menu, there is a new C4D Home. It's going to pop open a kind of new splash screen, and inside of it, you're going to see some different example files and some templates, and you're going to see all of your recent files. I actually really like this interface, and I wonder if that will become like a new default splash screen at some point. But for now, I'm not sure. But one cool thing I like about this is you can actually click on custom and you see we get all these little preset scenes, like some different templates that we could use. And if you click on here, you can see scenes added to the default scenes folder in the asset browser will appear here. If I click on view, it's actually going to pop open your asset browser and look, we've got some different scene files in there. So in theory, if you had some scene file that you're going to be opening all the time, or let's say you got like five different default scene files that you want to be opening, I could go and maybe make a, I'll click on my HDRs and let's drag one in. And let's say that maybe I'm always starting with a default cube and maybe that default cube has an axis inside of it. I can drop that on there. So I've kind of modified and made my own little default scene file here ready to use. So now I could say, go back into the default scene, click on, let's see, where do we do this? I'm going to say create scene yeah add scene to database so i save that and now you can see it's automatically made a new untitled six it's made a little thumbnail i could click on that i can rename it actually double clicking is going to <laughs> load it in so we can say show details i can rename and we'll just say uh hdr i plus cube say okay cool so now you know i close down cinema more stuff is happening blah blah, blah. and now i can say hey i'm going to go to my c4d home and now First of all, you see that that's the new scene, but you'll also see my cube appear in these templates in the custom section, and I can just click on that and open it up, and now I'm directly in that scene. So yeah, I'm curious to see where that goes in the future. Pretty handy, uh, and it's something for trial users to like get a little bit more familiar more quickly, but I like that that's been added. And then heading right on into some asset browser tweaks. Not so much tweaks, but mostly new content. I'll just open up a new scene file, open up the asset browser, and by default, you see we get this new home button with some folders that jump to the most common things. Already, I've been enjoying the rearranging of a lot of the assets, like the fact that HDRs got moved to the top layer here so you can find them easily. I'm constantly grabbing these. You can scroll through and grab them. What's really nice is you can just drag them directly into your viewport now, and that will automatically feed them into a dome light just ready to go. And if you want to swap that and grab the next one, drag it in, it will just replace it. So like just a very nice handy workflow that is very quick. So that rearranging has been very much appreciated. But then we've got now some more new organizing. Like if you click on materials, you've got these folders. But if you scroll down, you're going to start seeing all these materials. And now all the materials in this list are going to be red shift materials. And you see that everything's got this nice kind of transparent, uniform gray background. And that is telling you that, yes, that stuff has been updated and is ready to go for Redshift. So all the old stuff is still here, all the legacy materials, but there's a new legacy folder. So all the stuff is over there. And you see that these are not on that transparent background. That's implying that it's a little bit older. Still useful, but you'd have to like retexture it depending on which renderer that you're using. So yeah, these materials are just like kind of ready to rock inside of here, which is super handy and you can visually tell right away. And I do like that they put the little Redshift icon on there as well. On top of that, there are just some new scene files to play around with here. I'll click on home and then you can always click on like new capsules and see a whole bunch of new stuff. And here you're going to see that there's a bunch of new pyro examples. But if you didn't know, you can always type into your search because it's organized this way. You can type in, say, 2024. And here's everything that's been added in 2024, the year of 2024. So you see, all, look at all this, like, look how much stuff, all these models and everything that's been added just this year. And here's all these new materials that are Redshift ready to go pyro presets like uh and then here's all the materials making those up which you can of course just play around with directly as well so lots of stuff's been added but you can also type in like dash eight actually dash oh eight and now here's everything that was added in the eighth month so that's the new stuff here's all these pyro presets that we'll talk about in a little bit and here's everything that came out in seven and you see like all these new trees and all these lovely plants like look at all these new types of dirt let's uh, zoom up on these a bit 
Yeah, so many different plants, kind of everything that you could be looking for. And a bunch of, I think, like photogrammetry-based dirt here, which is really useful. I really wanted those. So very happy to see those. And then we can jump back and see what was added in six. And you see a bunch of models added in in that one. So yeah, all very, very nice. I'm going to go back to seven. There was also some additions here. If I right-click on this, you can always say, right-click on any of them and say reveal in asset browser. So you can see that some new scene files were added to scene nodes. So if you want to get into scene nodes, you can go and pop something like this open. So this is actually the way I love learning where you can pop this open. And now you see we've got this bookshelf here. And if I were to double click on the bookshelf, I can go inside of it and look at the nodes that made this up. So this is actually put together by Donovan Keith, but he was using like stuff that Rocket Lasso made. So he's using the partition modifier inside of this in order to subdivide a random plane and then subdivide more and make these books. So really fun examples to kind of deconstruct and make cool things. So double click on this one, got some cool asset browser stuff here. Let's see, that's missing the font, but if I were to hit play, here, you can see that we get this really cool, what's it, I, the, some sort of something diffusion, I forget, uh, reactive diffusion or something like that. So a really cool effect there. I can double click on that. And then inside here, you can see it's actually very well explained, very simple setup, but you can go inside the memory and you can see how it's getting the positions, resampling, setting the positions, uh, relaxing the points. So, you know, that, that essentially is a setup. It resamples, gets the position, sees if they're too close to each other, and then relaxes them, and then it keeps on looping again and again. So, yeah, reverse engineering that type of stuff is my favorite way of learning. So, yeah, very cool. Um, so, I think that actually mostly covers the stuff inside the asset browser. So, that means we can move to the new object profiler. Now, this one is going to be super handy for the TDs out there, but also just for any artist who is trying to figure out what is making your scene go slower than you think it should be? So let's jump into this scene file. So in this scene file, this is something I actually made during a Rocket Lasso live stream, which, by the way, is usually happens on Wednesdays. You can come join and ask questions. It's on season break right now, but it'll be coming back in the new year. But anyway, here's something that we made in that episode where we've kind of got this plant growth going. You see all these lovely plants kind of growing across the entire thing. This was a live question that somebody asked, and I thought we could make some pretty cool stuff with it. But say, okay, it's, it's running fine. You know, actually, I'm getting really good feedback here, but why don't we go to Window, and you'll find right here the new Object Profiler. And essentially, it is a hierarchy. What this one is doing is giving us feedback on how long it's taking for everything to calculate. So if I rewind and hit play, you're going to see, based on percentages, how long is it taking to do everything? And you can see here that it's taking almost you know, 35, 40% of the time is just this target effector. And that's because in this rig, I had done this fancy thing where I wanted everything to perfectly face out from the surface of the geometry. And inside of that, I want to be able to make wind. So it's kind of like this nice dynamic wind kind of blowing around, which I think worked well. You see everything drifting around, but it's taking a lot of calculation time. Now, there's a couple different modes here. Well, let's say I want to get more specific. It's okay, so now I know what is taking the longest time to calculate. So now I could move into my target wind, and inside of there, you see, oh, I've got a bunch of different things going on. So I got a delay and two different randoms, and then a volume measure instance. So let's try turning off a few things. You saw I was, you know, 35, 30, you know, 40%. So let's turn off that, and let's see. I was like, mm, no, pretty slow still. Let's turn this on. No, still pretty slow. Turn this off. And you still see that that is still by far taking a lot of the calculation time. So then if I turn off this volume measure instance, suddenly you see that it is not in the top anymore. So it was actually this volume measure instance that was taking so long to calculate. And that's because it's set to surface and there's just a lot of polygons on this thing. So essentially what was happening, if I hit NB, you can see all these polygons and this was calculating like from the surface, like the normal directions. And there's just you know, so much mesh there to calculate that it was taking a long time for it to process everything. So that's why target was the slowest thing. Here, here we are viewing it as a percentage, but you can view it a lot of different ways. First of all, we could say, well, show me as an absolute time. I think this is actually the default is time, but to me, the percentage is more relevant. But here we can see how many milliseconds it's taking. So, you know, hit play, and now we can see the different length on each one. And this is kind of telling you like on each frame, how long each thing took to calculate. But you could also say, uh, you know, I'll go back to percentage just because I like that. Uh, I can also say uh, all frames. So if I click on all frames, then this is actually a running total of all of them. So I think it might be sort of averaging them all out. So you see this is calmed down a lot more. 
and each one is calculating. Now, this is going to take a little bit of overhead, you know, a little bit of calculation time for it to actually be activating. But now you can actually see like this is in a little bit more stable configuration of exactly how long different things are taking. So, uh, yeah, I mean, for the most part, that's the object profiler. If you're building tools, if you're building rigs, if you're trying to figure out like this just doesn't feel like it should be taking as long, you could be like, oh, it's this object. And oh, like this, these, there's so many more polygons on this object than I realized. Of course, that's taking a little bit longer to go. So yeah, object profiler. It is an object manager. So you can like click on the objects directly in here. I think you can even do things like, you know, drag things from like one to the other. So I could make it as a child over here. So it is just another version of the object manager, but very fun to actually be able to get this data like in real time. So yeah, definitely recommend checking that out. Next up is changes to Redshift. So we got a little variety of things sprinkled in here. If we move into this new scene file, the first thing is if we go to our camera menu, the motion camera, the morph camera, and the camera crane are all now compatible with Redshift cameras. I've got one in the scene already. I actually never played around with the crane camera before. It's pretty cool. So on the tag, you see I've keyframed the heading and the pitch, and it's targeting this box right there. So if I link to it and hit play, get this nice smooth camera movement. So pretty cool there. Now, I've also added on a rocket lasso field driver tag. And if you didn't know, you can hold down shift and double click on it and it's going to enable or disable. So you see, I've got some vibration on the position and the rotation, which is piggybacking off of the camera cranes animation. So if I hit play, you can see I got this shake on top of that. So kind of fun to layer those up. If you hold down shift and double click it, it'll disable that. So let's dealing from that and talk a little bit more about substances. So inside of our materials, let's go to our asset browser and search for the word substance. And here's a bunch of them. Right clicking on one, I'll say reveal in asset browser and here they all are. Now in a previous version of cinema, these became compatible. The SBAR files, the substance designer files are compatible with Redshift. So I can grab one of these and drag it in. Now, if you've never played with one of these before, they are actually really cool because it's kind of like you get infinite materials inside a single material. So let's go to the Substance 3D material, and this is importing the settings that were made in Substance Designer. Now, that piece of software will essentially procedurally make materials, and they're all tileable, which is really cool. So let's go and give ourselves a little extra interface here. And you can see that we can change the color of the cardboard. Actually, why don't we just show you? Uh, I will drag this directly on this box and activate Redshift. Let's start that rendering. And you'll see that we have this lovely cardboard box right there. And we can go into our materials and we can change like the wave amount. We change the ripping. We can say it's not very dirty. So it's ripped, but not dirty. And you see the material updates. And then we got all these little holes in the box. So the new thing that has been added is that we have these presets that we get access to. So any presets that were made in substance will now translate into cinema. So I can say that this one is dirty cardboard and you can see that we have that. I will duplicate this and apply it to the second box and I'll duplicate it a third time and apply it to the third box. And yeah, now these are all laid out. Now, if you haven't played with the placement tool in a while, it's pretty fun. Let's grab the Cinema 4D placement tool and I'll move this box up and kind of place it dynamically right there. And I'll grab this box here and I'll pull that up in the air, kind of boop it around and place it right there. So yeah, got those placed super easily. So now let's grab the second material, change my preset to damage cardboard, grab the third preset and say that this one will be folded cardboard. And now we have three different types of cardboard all from the same substance. Now you can always make more duplicates. I could copy that box again and I'll just physically move it up and I'll make another copy of that material and replace this one. And just by changing my random seed, then I'm going to get a different layout and different, you know, kind of patterns on there with, with just a copy of that material. So really easy to make like infinite variations of one thing just on that. So yeah, really excited to tinker around with that. And there are more materials as well. We got a bunch of them built straight in here, but there's a lot you can find online, or of course you can make your own inside a substance, but let's go and grab this worn, I'm not sure if it's worn rusty fence, but I'm going to drag that directly on this little bit of fence I've got there. And yeah, rustic painted fence here. And we've got presets on that. So you can see here, we've got kind of this paint. We can change the pattern to aged wood planks. We can change it to dense boarding. Like complete, yeah, look completely different look on that one. It looks amazing. We're just on a plane there. Look how good that looks. And then here's kind of this light blue paint. And then, you know, potentially this could also work inside of like some animation uh, where the rocket field driver is actually able to get applied on top of materials as well. 
So if I were to right click on this cube, I will add a new rocket field driver. And what do I want to drive? I want to drive the color of this material. So I can drop that on here. And let's say that this is being driven by the field itself. And I will feed in maybe a rocket noise, go to color remap, go to my gradient, load in a custom gradient. This can be anything I want. Uh, let's grab, here we go, this bourbon preset I've got. And now by going to my random here, and let's crank up the contrast a little bit. And now as I go to different seeds, every seed is going to be a different one of those colors that will just translate through and automatically render. So yeah, that makes it that the rocket field driver can actually drive materials. Any parameter that's kind of promoted up to this top level will automatically work. Or I do not think that the Maxon one can do that. So it's another little difference between the two. So let's give that a pause. That is uh, some updates to substance and how useful that they can be. Uh, moving on, let's pop open just a new scene file here and double click and make a new material, jump inside of it. Now, if you didn't know, you can right click and you can always say add new inputs here. So I could say, hey, add a new color input. And now we've kind of got this external control. So I could say, hey, I want to control the color with that input. But a feature that is here now is that we can actually drag these out and let them be floating in the scene. And let me actually A, B test this for you. If I open up the previous version of Cinema and open up and do a similar thing, we could still add an input and we could link it and we could actually it kind of popped out in a weird way there, but I could tear this out and you see it's a little bit different, but you see it lost its name. And interestingly, if I were to grab the color and say, well, I want to drive the roughness as well. You see that these parameters are changing in kind of this unintuitive way where in the new version, if I were to link to something else, it is actually going to maintain whatever we called it. So just a lot cleaner of a workflow with that. So hopefully that's a little bit more useful. I'm now able to twirl this down and see what my control is right there. So yeah, super dig the ability to do that. Continuing with Redshift, I'm gonna jump into uh, this scene file and I made a little pool scene, but we're not gonna be able to render this in real time because it was taking a while to render. And that is they made a change to the caustics inside of Redshift. So if you go into your render settings, by default, you would have caustics and you could enable them. And we had photon only. So let me open up my picture viewer because I already rendered this out. You will see that this is what it looked like. This is photon caustics in this pool. And that's because it's a big, broad dome light. And the dome light wouldn't be good for casting these photons. So what you need is a different mode. And the mode is now called brute force. And brute force is specifically designed to work with like really big lights, especially something like the dome light. So with that in mind, here was the other render I did, and this is using the exact same scene, the same lighting, and now you can see I'm actually getting these proper caustics there. Uh, a bit of a warning, both of those scenes took quite a while to render, that's why this resolution is so small, but it, you know, th this is night and day for what photons were trying to do with this dome light, and then this is what the sky is now illuminating just by changing that to brute force, and pretty much leaving it all default settings. So yeah, brute force. Now, in addition to that, there are a couple other tweaks that I don't really have demos for. I, these videos are too long already. I can't talk about every little redshift thing as well. Maybe we'll get EJ on to talk about it a little bit, but there is a new uh, volume Z depth AOV when it comes to volume. So if you're like rendering out smoke or clouds, you actually get a depth pass of those. And lastly, there are a bunch of tweaks to the tune shader where like the tone mapping was changed in the way it interacts with the contour shading. Uh, and they added like alpha masks to the contour. So seemingly some cool stuff, but like I haven't really played around with it. And this video would be like four hours long again. So we don't need that. So those are the tweaks to Redshift. Now here's some fun stuff inside of rigid bodies that we now have. So moving on, we've got the force is now applied to rigid bodies. So I've got a cloner here. It's all set up with rigid bodies already. If I hit play, you see I've got gravity turned off. So pretty much nothing happens. A couple are colliding with each other. So now I can make the simulate force. And essentially force is just like particle on particle kind of attraction. So all these want to be attracted to anything within a certain range. So if I hit play, we're going to see that not much happens out of the gate. I'm going to make the strength way stronger. And now you can see everything within a certain range is going to start getting pulled into everything else in that range. So pretty fun along those lines. That's something I like doing. Let's actually use the MoGraph one this time. You could use the rocket lasso field driver as well. But using the built-in MoGraph one, why don't we right click and say field driver add. And this time I'm going to say I want this to go from 500 to, I don't know, 3000. Let's make it huge. 
and then we'll make a field. This time we will use a rocket lasso timer just because it's nice and straightforward. And I'll say over the course of, let's say the entire animation, it is going to slowly increase to that value. So now if I hit play, we're going to see that the force is increasing and increasing and increasing uh, their outer distance. So now they're getting attracted to things that are further and further away from each other. You see that all these cubes are getting pulled in this tighter and tighter clusters. So yeah, pretty fun to combine all of those. Uh, sometimes they, <laughs> the forces are so strong they're getting collapsed into each other. Uh, and then just so you know, the reason they're not rotating is I went into the forces and I gave them a lot of follow rotation. So they don't want to rotate. So you get to keep those geometric shapes. But yeah, force was always really fun to play around with in the bullet simulation. And now we have it in the rigid body. So I really dig it. Next up, we've got this letter T. And I'm actually going to use our upcoming plugin, which is, of course, a voxel mesher. I've been teasing this one for a while. We had to interrupt it to get Field Driver out because once I found out Maxon was working on theirs, we weren't about to throw away a year and a half worth of work. But this one is going to be coming out very soon. It's going to be in final beta, like essentially as soon as this video comes out. But anyway, I'm going to feed this letter T into a volume builder. And inside the volume builder, I'm going to feed that into a voxel mesher. And I see I get these cubes. So that's pretty handy. It's just made of cubes now. So, you know, we can, you know, this is what this plugin does. It converts that stuff into voxels, essentially, into these cubes. But I'm going to say go into cube mode. Now you see we get all these cool little cubes. But I'm going to say we get the sandy button that says convert to cloner. So I'm going to convert it to a cloner. And now it's actually just returning points. And I'm cloning onto those. So now the cloner has the exact same layout. But now it's really simple for me to right click and say simulation or rigid body on there. And if I hit play, then now we've got this pile of cubes that can just fall and collapse and you know, fill up the entire area. So that's pretty fun. Uh, I'll make sure the entire volume is filled, making sure that my voxel size is going to the interior. But then I want to show the actual new feature here. And that is the ability for a bunch of different properties, including friction and bounciness and the stickiness and thickness and also let's see i think density and also the follow position and no, no not those two so just the density all of those settings can now be fed mograph weights so let's set that up i'm going to say i want this to be sticky i'll set this to one and hit play and let's see okay that's pretty sticky you see the whole thing is kind of clumped up in, in a really fun way uh let's make it even stronger and see if we can get those to, yeah, there we go. So those are sticking pretty well. The whole thing will eventually collapse. Uh, maybe we can push it even further, see if we can get those to really stick and not want to fall. Yeah, that's pretty good. So now on the actual cloner here, I will right click and add on a MoGraph weight map. And let's click it again so we can actually use fields. And inside the fields, I'll make a linear field. Let's make that pretty tight. So I'll say, I'll just shrink that way down. And now you can see where the weights are on that. So I'm going to say in the beginning, I want the weights to be really strong, like right here. So I'll keyframe that and let's keyframe the position on X. And then let's say, yeah, not too long after we'll go to 30 and we'll just have this pass through. So now there's actual, you know, an actual MoGraph weight, which is shifting over time. And you see, it's always sampling the original position. That's very important to note. It's not this modified moved position, but now I can go to my rigid body tag, drop this into the weights of the stickiness, and it's going to multiply on them. So right now it's one, 100%. And when it goes to red, it's zero, 0%. Zero so it would be 0% sticky. So actually I should probably make this delay. So I'm gonna grab both my keyframes and scoot them over. So nothing happens for the first 30 frames. Okay, cool. So now when I hit play, it's sticky. And then as I pass through, all the stickiness just goes away and the whole thing falls apart. So yeah, we now can use weight maps to drive all those different properties. We can have different things be bouncy, bouncy to different degrees. We can have them have different thicknesses. We can have different frictions on different objects all by using a weight map on there, which is really, you know, that's a really powerful addition there. Now, moving on to a different aspect, uh, we got a change to the connector. So uh, I'm going to show kind of a more complicated rig here. If you remember, I had that tentacle rig a couple of videos back and it was really fun to make that like dynamic tentacle, but we had to have all the pieces be even sub you know even distance between the subdivisions but now we don't have to anymore thanks to a special new mode so i've got a bunch of collider spheres here and now i've just got this plane so i'm going to subdivide this plane randomly using the rocket lasso partition modifier you can also just use the knife tool and make a bunch of cuts but this was just a way of me getting some random cuts on that thing so now i'm going to use a thicken to actually add some thickness to that 
and then use the fracture to explode those apart into individual pieces. So now each of these is its own individual piece. Now, right-clicking on it, I can add on a simulation rigid body, and you'll see if I hit play that every one of these is a completely separate piece, all collapsing down, so kind of fun there. But I want to connect all of them. So simulate connectors, and we can make any type here, but let's make it bendable. So I'll make an angular connection. And as before, I can scoot this off to the side to whatever amount I want. So I'll scoot that off 25. It's a little bit big in the viewport, so I'll say display size down to 11. And now we have those. So, okay, those pivots are there, but they're going to pivot from kind of a weird location. If I hit play, it will work, but they're all kind of offset and not quite right. Well, there's a new mode in there. If we go to object and we change our mode to distance, which we've had before, and I'll set it all the way down. So now there's just connections based on their distance. There is a new placement settings category. And right now it's being based on their center, but I can change that. And that's what it traditionally was. But now I can set it to the closest point. And now essentially it's a halfway point between the closest points. So now you see when I zoom in, there is exactly one of these in between where each one was connected. Now it is still relative. I could grab my connector here and I could scoot it around so I could pivot from one side. I could pivot from the other. I could pivot from the center. But if I grab that and just kind of drag it to where it looks like it's visually correct, now those are pivoting all from one side, almost like we put a piece of masking tape all along the backside here. If I hit play, now it falls, and you'll see that they're all bending and collapsing on that side. Just go to my connector and say, don't ignore the collision. So every block does collide with every other. And now you can see how the whole thing's going to fall and plop and bump and fall over, and they're all connected on the back. So a lot more powerful of a dynamic connection between these. So I really like that. Just for fun, let's hit R for rotate. I'll spin these all vertically, exactly 90 degrees, and put them all back approximately in the center. And now all of them are free to spin based on their next closest connection. So now as I let them drop, you see them all spin around, and then they should all settle kind of flat on the ground. No, enough friction for them not to. So you can see how it's very easy for the connectors now to automatically adapt to these varying sizes. So a really great addition to those. And then lastly, as far as rigid bodies are concerned, this one is very handy. In fact, why don't we pop open the previous version of Cinema? And here is an emitter, and I'm using a bunch of the Rocket Lasso Field Driver, but it's just making it spin and do all sorts of cool colors. So you see this is kind of snapping to different locations, and it is spinning out particles. I'm going to activate this cloner. And by the way, this is one of the demo scene files that comes along with Field Driver. So you can see I'm just shooting out a bunch of cubes, and they're doing their own thing. They're just cloned directly on there. But now I will right click on them and say, I would like to add a rigid body. And now they are rigid body, but you'll see that they're just kind of falling. They're just getting spit out and dropping away. They're not taking on any of the properties except for the color and their initial position. But now if we go into the new version, the exact same scene, hit play. Now you see the same setup. I'll activate the clones. So those are spitting out a bunch of cubes. And now if I right click and say, add a rigid body, you'll suddenly see that they are spinning out based on the direction that they're being shot. So that is because when you add on um, the tag, you'll get these three new settings where it is taking on the linear velocity, the angular velocity, and the orientation of the particle. So this sets that first initial rate for us. So yeah, a bunch of uh, kind of a grab bag of things inside of rigid bodies, but a bunch of really useful and powerful additions for us to be able to make more advanced rigs. Moving right along, let's talk about pyro changes. Now, this one is definitely a grab bag of random stuff kind of all over the place. A lot of it kind of falls on the technical side, but I'll cover all the ones that I think are relevant. So the first thing out of the gate, let's just create a sphere in a brand new scene, all defaults, create a pyro emitter, and let's hit play, and you'll see we get our standard fire and smoke. Now, a couple things to note right away is it should just be running faster for you. And that's because some settings have been changed and there's been some optimizations, which is super handy. So generally speaking, the defaults should be saving a lot on VRAM. So if you've been running out of RAM, hopefully this is gonna be working a little bit better for you. The overall defaults should be set to be faster without really looking very different, which is amazing. And one of the biggest things for speed up, actually there's two different ones. One is a min max setting. So let's go into our pyro output and then I'll make sure to go to Pyro Scene. Actually, just to make sure everybody's on the same page there, you would click here, you'd move to Pyro Scene, you'd twirl this down, and you go to Pyro, and I actually get to the, all of these settings. And what you suggest be substeps is now minimum substeps and maximum substeps. So 
essentially when things are moving really fast, uh, you might need to uh, crank up the sub steps, but now it's kind of smart about it. So I could say, well, if it's moving really fast, I want you to use, to use two sub steps, but it's only going to do it when it needs it. If things are moving slow enough, then it'll ignore that. So essentially you can get higher quality and it's only paying for it when it really needs it instead of it being applied globally. So great addition right there, but even bigger than that for speed. And if you ever watch my older videos, I was a, one of the ways I would speed things up was changing our padding mode where padding by default was set to two, but if you drop it down to one, then it would go way faster. And sometimes though, if your pyro, your smoke, your fire was going too fast, it would kind of fill up a block and then it couldn't escape because the pyro system is set up where it's kind of creating these big giant voxels. And it's like, okay, here's where I'm calculating. And so this was like padding to be like, oh, you might escape your current block, go to the next one. But now there's a way smarter system to determine where those blocks should be. So in spite of the padding, being at two in automatic mode, it's still set to two. It is automatically jumping. Actually, it's probably not limited to two now I think about it. That's if we set it to a constant. And as soon as I turn on a constant, I could feel the speed hit. When we go to automatic, it's just going to set it to whatever it needs to, depending on how fast the pyro is moving. So if I scroll down here, we should be able to turn on draw tree structure. And so essentially these boxes are what I'm talking about. In the past, there will have been way more boxes for the padding but now it's really smart about only generating the ones that it really needs. And the more boxes that are made, the slower things go. And essentially that was the biggest speed hit. So that is now the biggest speed improvement. Now, let's see, what else? There's a couple of other changes inside of the tag. There's two new emission types. So one is our, our sparse surface. So if we turn this on, Essentially, from my point of view, actually, let's let's A, B test this. I can hit play, just watch it. Just kind of watch the smoke, kind of get a vibe for the way that feels. And I'll change that to sparse surface and run it again. And to me, feels pretty much identical. Like, it's probably technically a little bit different, but like the vibe of it doesn't change at all. But the sparse version is going to be using way less memory because it's using nano VDBs which I assume means is really intelligently subdividing on the object and it's only putting the detail where it needs it to be. So saving on a bunch of memory, we've also got sparse volume, which again, it's now the volume type. And I feel like I don't see a difference on that either in a good way. So to me, it's like, well, always use these sparse versions because they're going to be using less memory. Uh, on, in addition to that, another setting that could be relevant. And let's see if we actually visually see this. It's a little bit trickier. It's a little bit subtle. But let's take a look at this by default and kind of see the flow that we're getting. If we go back into our main pyro object, into the pyro scene, into the pyro settings, uh, if we scroll down underneath a new setting, and let's see, under advanced settings here, you're going to see there's something new called advection reflection. And essentially, this is going to take like tiny little energetic swirls and maintain them better. So again, let's take a look at this. And look at what we're seeing, the kind of these big blobs and they travel. This one is subtle, but I do feel like I see it. So I was running it again with first order advection reflection. What a great name. And hit go. And I feel like pretty quickly we start getting a little bit of extra detail in there and look at all the extra ridges that we're seeing. And I feel like we just end up seeing a lot more of this tiny detail kind of maintain their energy. Um, so that's definitely something you turn on. It slows you down a little bit, but I think it looks really nice. So I think, let me think, is there any other big ones? Uh, there's a new color mode that is just built in. Um, I, maybe, yeah, maybe, yeah, there's the, yeah, there's a legacy mode and there's the new perceived illuminance and it just handles color better. For the most part, you don't need to think about it where inside of your actual pyro tag, this probably mostly has to do with activating this color enable and the colors are just going to look better. You, you don't even have to think about it. And that's a lot of the stuff in pyro is it, it's just better and you don't have to think about it too much. But I do want to spend a little bit of time on an actually kind of artistically relevant setting, I think. So to do that, I'm going to jump into this scene file. In the scene, I've got this tiny little figure. It's actually regular scale. This is just a really big head just to give you a sense of scale because I wanted to be able to use the basic sphere. And let's scoot this over. Everything in the scene is default except this head has a collider tag on it. Right-clicking on the sphere, let's add a pyro emitter on there hit play. And the only thing I'm going to change is I'm going to turn off density. So now we've only got fire on there. 
And then let's disable noise. And that's just going to make it so that noise is not erasing out certain sections. So we have a lot more fire there. And anything else to change in here? Uh, might as well change this to sparse surface because it should just be saving on memory. And let's see, what else do I want to do? Well, right now the fire is going up quite a bit, but it's also fading out pretty quickly. So in my pyro output, let's go to pyro scene, twirl this down, go to pyro. So here we are. Now we could increase the sub steps if we wanted to. Lots of different settings we'd activate. But one thing I do want to do is go to my temperature buoyancy. And I'm just going to say, hey, you, you don't want to climb up as fast. I'll just say like 0 0.1, 0 0.01. So now gravity is not pulling up so hard on it. And then let's go down to temperature. There's a lot of settings in here. But the temperature is saying that this is going to fade pretty quick. Every frame it's losing like 7% of its heat. So I'm going to say only 1%. So it it, essentially the fire will live seven times as long. So you see now we get this big old flame going. So now we can actually talk about the new settings. So if we scroll back up again, under your extra forces, you will see a tab called shredding. Twirl that down, and we got a couple of new settings in here. Now, the main thing that this does is there's a new concept like a, of a temperature gradient where things are kind of hot in the center and they're cooler on the outside. Essentially, you know, the temperature gradient that we're seeing here. But that's now a variable that we can control with this push and this pull. So what does this mean? Well, if I were to grab the push strength and I grab it and drag it all the way up to the maximum amount, and let's rewind, you'll see that the fire is kind of pushing out in all directions because the fire is trying to go from areas that are really hot to areas that are less hot. And I feel like this is giving like a little bit more of a like a magical vibe to it. And it's another really cool control that we get. So you can see that flying out in all directions. We could increase this even more. Let's do like 33% and then start over. And we have fire everywhere, but it's pushing in almost all directions. And just a little bit of gravity is pulling it upward in general. But yeah, look how much more like kind of magical that that one feels. So it's a very fun kind of artistic setting to be playing around with. But you're not limited to going positive. You can actually also go negative. So I'll grab this and pull it all the way to negative 15 and restart. And now you'll see that the fire is just barely escaping. And that's because our push is now a negative value, pretty much saying that all the fire wants to go towards the hotter area. So everything stays really tight and clumped up together. And just by changing that one setting, I feel like it's, it changes visually, kind of artistically so much about it. So I have been enjoying kind of cranking that up to a higher value. But you can push things further, uh, your higher values here. You can also do a pull strength, um, which, and we've got this source threshold. So essentially we could say, when you're under a certain threshold, you want to pull in. And once you escape that, you want to push out. So essentially like the really hot fire can try and stay really tight and close together. And then once it escapes that, then it wants to spread out. So there's a lot of really cool artistic controls you can do with this. But just for fun, let's take this new fire that we've designed and let's scoot it inside of this head. And again, it's already a collider. I'll visually hide that sphere. And now let's hit play. And it should be colliding with the head. So you see the fire wants to spread out organically. And you see, based on the settings I did, this is why I lowered the gravity. It just kind of barely wants to start filling up the entire surface. So yeah, very cool combination here. We could push that further. Let's say, actually, I don't think it's spreading very much. So let's go back to the settings. And yeah, right now it's only at 15, but we could push it further. Let's say it goes out like 25. So you see this spreads out more and it's going to travel up more. All the fire wants to disperse so much more. So yeah, a lot of different settings we can combine artistically control the way we want this to look. We could completely get rid of the gravity. Let's go back to general and go to our buoyancy and say zero. And now in no way does a fire specifically want to go up. It's just going to kind of float around and maybe fill the area as it wants to spread. So it's just as likely to go down as it is up. And yeah, just via the, the heat itself, it's traveling up. And then you got forces like your turbulence where we could start like cranking up the turbulence more, change the frequencies. We could build... Uh, a turbulence of, of turbulence force in here and have the fire blow certain ways and other ways. Now, when it comes to the shredding itself, like I said, there's some pull, there's some push, but you can also change it to be based off the fuel or the density. Just keep in mind, if you change it to density, which is pretty much the smoke, that you're going to have to use way higher values where I'm talking like you got to put a zero. And if that doesn't work, put another zero. If that doesn't work, put another zero. It's just because of the density. Like I think the gradient is so much more subtle that you have to the power up so far so and i think this maximum magnitude i've been kind of thinking of it like contrast but yeah mostly the source threshold of like where's the pull where's the push and just filling up the overall thing with fire like just some really fun artistic settings to play around with 
So yeah, those are some of the new Pyro settings. Uh, the last thing to mention is if you go into your asset browser, there are a bunch of new Pyro presets in here. I will just search for the word Pyro. Let's type it correctly, Pyro. And I can just right click on one of them and say, reveal an asset browser. And you got a bunch of these presets. There's a bunch of like really fun ones like this ink drop. Let me pop that open. Now, unfortunately, well, I guess just so people can see them accurately, they lowered the voxel size or I guess made it bigger so it doesn't have as much detail. So if you've got a decent computer, I, I highly recommend making sure that you uh, go inside and click your simulation scene and then under pyro, set your voxel size to what they recommend. So in this case, I'll say 0.2 and run it again and look how different it's going to look. So obviously it takes long to calculate, but look how much like more liquidy we're getting from that. Like they look dramatically different if you don't drop the voxel size down. But yeah, look at that. Wow, that's really cool. Uh, and a bunch of these presets are just really good, fun places to open it up, uh, reverse engineer it. Uh, this magic one is really cool. Uh, hitting play by default. Let's see what that looks like. You see it kind of zipping around. There's even some particles being generated, like really fun, smoky effects getting blasted around. And of course, we got these animated previews, so I can crank this up more, and I can just mouse over it. You get some fire, campfire, contrails, <laughs> T-Rex with a flamethrower. Uh, this dry ice one's really fun. Uh, I actually had opened this one up, and I was playing with it a bunch to just get uh, different effects out of it. So yeah, really fun to open these up and reverse engineer and see exactly what they're doing. Honestly, I almost always use Pyro, not for fire, but for these kind of like misty effects. So really fun to be seeing stuff like the fire extinguisher and these explosions and like, you know, not necessarily just the uh, fire. So yeah, seeing things like uh, just like this little wisp of smoke coming off of it, like very fun combinations. So definitely go and check those out in the Asset Browser as well. But I think that will wrap up Pyro Changes, which will transition us nicely to Particle Changes. Now, actually, some of the particle changes you can see right here in my little title cards I've been using. Let's start by opening up a new scene file. And in the new one, let's talk about some basic changes. I will open up my custom particle layout. This doesn't exist yet in the cinema. And the first thing I'll do is just make a basic emitter and I'll make them a little bit larger so you can see it and hit play. And we've got particles shooting out. But now there's a new shape type and it's called point. And it's just going to be shooting out a single, like an infinitely small point of particles in every direction, actually straight. We can go every direction by setting direction to random, and now they're shooting out in every way. Excellent. Uh, next up, we have infinite. This infinite checkbox is now making it so that the particles will just live forever. In the past, you had to have it set to zero, and that meant they'd live forever. But now if you turn this off, zero does mean zero. So it's actually something you could animate and control. Now, the next thing, I'm gonna change my emitter type to be a circle and then set my direction to be radial. And what hopefully we're getting, oh, let's go back to infinite. Now you can see I'm shooting off in all directions. And just so we can see them a little bit better, I will set this to be random based on a gradient. And we'll just do a full color, double the knots so we can see every color. There we go, lots of different colors. Now let's talk about the math node because there's a couple of important tweaks in there. Let's make a new math node and instantly you see it's setting everything to zero on X but I'll say I want to set it to zero on Z, which it already was. So you'll see that we're just getting this flat layout, but now you'll see that we can just assign a value. So I can say, okay, everything is set to this position on Z. But now if I twirl this down, you can see we have variation. We have variance here. So if I set this to 50, now these are being randomly set in all these uh, you know, positive and negative values. If we view this exactly from the side, you can see that every single one has been given essentially a new constant and it's just sitting in that new plane. So this variation is actually a very welcome addition. This is going to make math a lot more powerful and it was already crazy powerful. But there is also a new, let's zero this out. There's also a new random setting here. And random, we can set a minimum value and a maximum value, which is great. And it's random, kind of similar, but we can set two exact values. But then there's also this animation speed. So I can say animation speed of one. And now you see this constant transition along these two values. And, you know, this is just with it set to assign, but we can do something like set it to add, which is going to be super crazy fast. Well, if we set this to maybe minus 15 and positive 15, as the particles are made, they're going to kind of drift one way and then drift the other way. So we get all this lovely kind of variation just with a math node. And of course, this could be driving so many different properties. This is the position Z, but we could be controlling uh, we could be controlling XYZ on that. And now we just got this natural kind of turbulence traveling all over the place. 
And layering these things up, I think, is going to be like really powerful. Uh, I can't wait to explore that more. I think we'll be using it pretty often. Uh, moving on, I don't usually cover bug fixes, but there's a pretty major bug fix that came in this version that I want to mention, because if you've been watching my live streams, a lot of people were asking cool particle questions, but it always required a collider. And the collider had a bug in it that was driving me crazy during the live streams. And in the older version of cinema, if I hit play, you're going to see the bug. Right now, I'm just dropping some particles on a plane, and you see a bunch of them are getting stuck. And it kind of made it impossible to work with this. And it was kind of like this weird thing that they were getting stuck on like the specific polygon. So if I set a five by five, you start seeing like this very different pattern that kind of is kind of like along the seam of the polygon. Very strange. But now that exact same scene file in the new version, hit play. They fall. And now you see them just smoothly traveling along the side. So like now they don't get stuck, which means we can make a whole bunch of cool things. So like one of the scene files that we were trying to do was like this nice goopy setup. So if I hit play, we should get this burst of particles. And thanks to some very strong cohesion strength on the flocking, they all kind of want to stick to each other. So at, you see them kind of coalescing a little bit there already, which is cool. And now as they fall, they are successfully colliding with this shape. And then gravity is slowly letting them slide along. And we kind of get these little goopy tendrils going. And... You know, some of the parts will be able to slide away and you really get kind of a fun fake liquidy effect that you see the whole thing kind of getting coated. So yeah, that type of effect, very, very fun to do. Uh, moving on, let's jump to another simple scene file. If I hit play, we got a very simple change to look, spin, and turn modifiers. So what's going on right now is it's shooting out particles that are going to collide with the surface. And... Then when they collide, the collider is saying, switch the group. And then that group is saying, lose all your velocity and then look in a new direction. And currently I'm just saying, hey, look in a random direction. So all that is stuff that we've had for a while. You can see that these are just flying and they're suddenly snapping to a new direction. The new thing that look and spin and turn have is this turn setting. And what we can do is set a specific angle. And now I'm saying that every frame, you can only rotate six degrees. So when I hit play, and they start colliding, you're going to see them slowly rotate into their position. So a very handy thing to be able to control that speed instead of it just popping in, it's kind of slowly transitioning into that new position. And you can do that per frame or per second. So yeah, a lovely little addition to those. Next up, kind of continuing the theme from Pyro earlier, I'll make a brand new sphere and a mesh emitter. And because it was selected, it was automatically fed in. And let's see, I'm going to make a bunch of particles. So in the under emission, I'll say make a thousand particles and under properties, I'll say a speed of zero. So hitting play from the surface, we should be getting just a whole bunch of particles. I will increase them so you can actually see them here. And now let's add pyro on and some new frames. I will add a select the sphere, right click simulation pyro emitter. And now we're going to get a you know giant burst of fire and smoke. Excellent. So now we can add on our pyro advect. Now that's something that we've had. So let's create a pyro advect and I'll drop it as a child of the particle group. And instantly you can see all of our particles flying and matching, which is great. But when I select my, ooh, I put the wrong thing in there. Let's grab this one just to stay organized. You can see that we've got a whole bunch more settings than we used to. Let's jump to this file or the older version of cinema and make a pyro advect. And you see the only thing before we had was matching the velocity. But now we can match the color and the alignment and the velocity, the angular velocity. So let's go and turn some of these on. I'm going to say I want the color mode to match the temperature and hit play. And now the particles, which were green, hopefully we're going to see that they are starting to go up and we see these black ones kind of twirling through there. Now I want to probably turn off the smoke. So we're only seeing, well, do we actually, I'm going to say that we want to keep the particles this way, but I'm going to brighten them up a bit. We've got this temperature scale. I'm going to set this up to two. And actually, yeah, I'm going to turn off the smoke. So let's say no density. So now we just have this fire. And there we go. Now we can see those particles start to go and transition up. Now they still eventually lose their brightness. Let's go inside here uh, in the pyro advect. This temperature scale, very important. You can see that they're going to lose their color very quickly. But as we increase the temperature scale, you actually see them be a little bit brighter. So two has been working out well for me. And eventually they start losing their radiance. And that's because of this multiply by radiance. If we turn that off, it's going to be like full power until they've lost all of it. And then they just turn black. Now, right now, these particles are just living forever, hanging out near here, just kind of visually taking up space. A cool thing that I can do is do a little bit of data mapper. 
So I'll say, take the data mapper, and I'll say, after the pyro advect, I would like to look at the color of these particles based on the red color of the particles from zero to one. I would like to control the radius of the particle from, let's say, zero to five in a linear way. Hopefully that works, but I need to be able to show it. So go to a particle group and say, draw the radius, but don't show the size right now. So if I hit play, let's see what we get. So now you can see I've got these particles and you see them drifting up. And do we have the radiance turned on? Yeah, let's make sure the radiance is turned on so they actually fade out. And now you can see that they are getting really tiny as they go. Let's hide the pyro. We can do that by going into our pyro output, twirling this down, going to pyro, scrolling to the bottom, and turn off draw pyro. So now you can see that these are being created. I think we could use a lot more particles. So let's say mesh emitter and jump this up to, I don't know, should we go 10 times the amount? Could be risky, but could be nice. Okay, so a bunch more particles there, and you can see they're fading out as they lose their redness, which is great. In the data, in the data mapper, I'm going to select the points, tell them to be soft, and then let's really crank this up high so that they're going to maintain a lot of their radius for a while and only fade out at the very end. There we go. Look at those. So now we got these lovely particles taking on the pyro effect. And keep in mind, there are no... There's no fire here. We're just seeing the final particles, and that's looking really nice. So we can even hide the original sphere, and yeah, just the particles. Now, we are not limited to just the color of the fire. I could switch this uh, pyro advect to be based on the color. I'm also going to turn off this data mapper because currently they'd be shrinking based on red. Now, currently there is no color, so there's no change in our color. So why don't we say that the color is going to be based on the sphere. So I'll right click on that and say, give me an other tag and make a vertex color map. Let's also bring it back so we can see it. And I would like to control that with transfer and control that via a random field. And that random field will make larger and larger and larger until you start getting some consistent color. I'll give that some animation speed. And let's saturate it up a bit using the rocket lasso, hue, saturation, and brightness. Crank up my saturation a little bit. And now we can go into our pyro and under color, let's enable the color. And right now it's just going to set it so we can say, oh, all of it should be pink. And now all the color will be pink. But let's set that back to the default of white. And if we twirl down color, enable, then we get this color map, which I love. And now we can drag in this color vertex map. And now the particles are taking on that color. Now I'm not worried about the radius anymore. So let's go back to our particle group and say, don't draw the radius. Instead, go back to two. And now our particles are taking on the color from our pyro advect. So yeah, love this combination. Very, very fun. Now you can transition the color fast or slow. And like I said, you can also do this alignment. I don't really have a demo for the alignment, but based on the temperature gradient or the density gradient, so essentially you're going from hot to cold, you could make them aim in a particular direction. And I'm assuming based on kind of like the way that the pyro is spinning, you could make the angles spin as well with your angular velocity mode. So very fun to be able to combine the color from Pyro, which is like one of the most fun things about it to me, and we can now combine it directly into our particles. Now let's move into the final particle demo, which is just really fun to me. I love this one. So let's start out with a spline. I'm just going to make an arc spline and make it really tiny. Now, uh, you'll need, in order to do what I'm about to do, you'll need uh, Maxon 1 because I'm going to use a Rocket Lasso made capsule modifier. And this is included if you have Maxon 1. If you don't, you can just draw some splines and the exact same thing will work. But I'm going to do a little bit more procedurally. So I'm going to search for the word branch. And you should already, if you have Maxon 1, you should already have this. And this was made by Rocket Lasso. If we drop this as a child of arc, you can see it's now modifying it with a bunch of branches. So a couple of things I want to do. Don't want to keep the original arc and I want to essentially just make one and I don't want to make two branches and I'll say I want to aim straight up on Y and have no angle and let's make it a length of 200. I'll also make a figure here just so we can see the scale we're working at. So there we go. So essentially I just made the trunk of a tree and I'll search for another branch because essentially I want the default values and I'll drop that in. And now you can see that the previous trunk is now getting modified to have these branches. I will say I only want a single one on each. Let's lower the countdown to four and have them only begin near the end. And I'm going to say that I want the angle to be zero. And then using this direction, like per step, I'm going to add some angle variation. And now you're going to see that these are able to kind of twist and wind around. 
I'll set the length to be relative and just be a little shorter than the original trunk. So yeah, there we go. Those are looking pretty good. We could even make a little bit of global gravity and I can have them droop down, but I could also have them kind of droop upward. So now grabbing that branch modifier, I'm going to duplicate it as a child again. And now my branches have branches. I can duplicate it again. And now my branches of branches of branches have branches. So yeah, it's a very easy way of making a tree. We can go inside here and we can you know change any settings we want, like really kind of break these apart. I could add more negative gravity, go up, or you could go down and have them droop down. Like it's so easy to make all sorts of different rigs here, you know, kind of, kind of just limited to your imagination. So yeah, uh, I'm going to do a couple different random seeds here to see if I get a layout. I really love the look of, oh, that's a point cap. Let's change the random seed. And uh, I don't want them going up quite as much as I am. So let's let them be a little more random. There we go. Okay. I like the look of that. I might just make those branches a little bit longer. Okay, cool. So that is now our tree. So now let's make an emitter. So I will make a new basic emitter, set that to be a circle. Let's make the radius, I don't know, 35 by 35. R for rotate. I'll aim it straight up. And I'm not sure how many particles I want, so I'll start out with about 5,000. And if I hit play, you can hopefully see that, yeah, we got particles shooting straight up. I'll move this to the end. Grabbing the particle group, I will increase the size of two so you can see it more clearly. Let's add a bunch more frames on here. So there we go, giant cluster of particles all flying up. I, I think I'd just like to change the color of them. So I'll change the properties to be noise-based, load in a gradient. So let's just grab full colors. And actually more fun, let's add in one of my neon presets that I made. So here we go, neon two or even neon three. So now we got these neon colors and based on noise. So if I make my noise large enough, we should be able to see we should be able to get like kind of some more coherent. Yeah, I want these more coherent clusters and we'll give it a little bit of movement speed, like 0.1 or 0.2. So now hopefully, yeah, this is slowly animating into different colors and that's exactly what I want. So I'm gonna give us lots of frames here and about how long it's gonna take. Let's see, they should live for about 300 frames. So I will also limit uh, the lifetime to about 300 frames. Cool. All right, now, let's actually use the new feature and that is follow spline. So create follow spline, drag it down. I usually like to make it a child of the group. You don't have to, but it just tells me clearly that this is affecting that particle group. And let's feed it a spline. Now by default, it's in rail mode. I'm going to go to guide mode and drop in my arc. And as soon as I do, look at that. These are now perfectly following that spline. If we start over, see that our particles are getting attracted to the spline and then they're traveling along these different branches. Now, I don't expect them to catch every branch. They're going to take the branch that's the path of least resistance effectively, but you can do a really fun combination here. And that is, let's make some flocking and put the flocking after the align the spline. And even at its default settings, it is now forcing those particles to spread out from each other. And because they're spreading out from each other, there's a little bit of thickness here. And now they start traveling down all those different branches. And it's going to be hitting these splits a lot better. And look at this growth that we're getting like so quickly. Uh, I might want more random color here. So I'm going to go back to my emitter and just double this gradient. So right click and say double knots. I think that'll just give us a little more variation in the color. A couple things. You're going to see that we're getting these clusters of particles at the end because the flock, this um, follow spline doesn't quite know what to do with them. So I'm going to go into the follow spline at the bottom. We have exit behavior and I'll say just kill those particles. So now when they get to the end of the spline, it just deletes them. So essentially once it gets into its radius, if it escapes that radius, it just deletes them. So we can push some settings a little bit further. I'm thinking that we grab the flocking, we make it a little stronger. I don't care about the cohesion strength. So we don't need to be doing those calculations. I'll drop it down. And then we've got our separation strength. I'll increase the power of that and maybe increase the radius just a little bit. And there we go. So now those are spreading out more. And now you can see that they're doing a pretty dang good job of traveling down every branch. A couple of them aren't, but that just goes back to the splitting. So maybe we just need some more particles in there. So let's say that this is going to emit even more. I'll jump it up to, let's say, 8888 for about 9,000 of them and give it a second for them to start you know, growing and spreading. And the particles start traveling down the different branches. Oh, it just looks so cool. Like, look at that. Like, oh, so good. And yeah, well, there's still barely enough particles. You see that that branch starts getting pretty thin, but they are able to travel down pretty much all of them. So I can hide the original spine. So now we're only seeing the end result of the tree. And look at that. Like, look at like how cool that that is. Now, using that branch spline modifier, I made a tree, but you could be making kind of anything that you want. You could be 
you know, it's actually how I made the opening animation, like that burst of branches behind the text. Or maybe this could be a bunch of vines spreading out on the ground, kind of like being a moss growing effect, like so many different possibilities. Now I'm building kind of a complex one, but this could just be traveling along some text if you wanted it to. But I love the way that this looks. A couple other things I want to tinker around here. You can see that there are a bunch of settings on here. We haven't had to change too many of them. We could set how quickly these are attracted to the spline, but the defaults are great. The follow spline is how fast they move along the spline. So we could slow it down or I could say, hey, five. And now they're traveling five times as fast. And right now they're having trouble sticking to it because it's going so quick. And then we can have a fall off on there so they get attracted or push away. But honestly, all the settings are so intuitive. I don't super feel the need to go through each one. Now we could go to a specific segment, but I think typically if you're feeding a spline, you want it to be on all of them. But you could separate them out and say, hey, segment one or segment two or segment three. Currently, it's going to the closest point, but it could be based on the age of the particle. It could be trying to get to a particular part on the spline. Uh, we can reverse the direction, but that's not going to be too helpful here. But you see all of those are going to start retracting, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, and rewinding. Oh, man, actually, that, that is super cool. That's not what I was expecting. But if we are emitting our particles all from the spline, we could have them be going in reverse and always transitioning to the end point. So, man, that's really cool as well. And as they gathered from, like, being thin on the branches, they get thicker because the flocking would push them apart. So, man, so many different possibilities there. Now, let's do a couple other cool things here. I'm thinking let's feed this whole thing into a volume because you got it for that. So I'm going to feed this into a builder. And let's drop the radius pretty far down. I'll say like three. And let's grab our particle group and also say you're down to three. And then I'll feed that into a builder. Oh, not a builder, into a mesher. And now you can see I've got this mesh. So you just want to make sure that the particles are thick enough that they're actually kind of filling everything out, which I think that's doing a pretty good job of. And it's a little bit lumpy right now. Uh, and we could use like some smoothing modifiers, but I'm just going to make a deformer and make a smoothing deformer. Drop that as a child of the mesher and instantly see it smooths it out pretty dang well. I will hide the particle so I just see the final mesh. And look at that. We have a tree that's naturally getting thinner as it goes. Like, oh, so good. Such a good way of generating that type of geometry. But now let's take on the colors of the particles. So I'm going to right click on our mesher, add an other tag, add a vertex color. And what colors do I want? Well, I want them from the particle group. And instantly you see the colors are translated onto here. But I'm going to say that I want them to be just based on the nearest possible point. We could click on average, but I like this method better, which is now we've assigned colors to all the different points on this tree. And now that that's happened, I will duplicate my vertex map, give it a new name. I'll just say vertex color two. And then based on that color, I'm going to say, mm, don't look at the particle group. Instead, look at the previous vertex map. And I'll say, look at, well, now I can say average them. So now instead of averaging every particle, I'm just averaging the points on the tree. And I think that maintains our color just a little bit better. And I can push it further and I can pull it back. So it depends on like how rough or how smooth you want that to be. Now, if you push it too far, you'll get nice smooth transitions, but you see things start turning a little bit gray. And if that's a problem, then now we can use the rocket lasso, use saturation brightness, and I can drop that in and I can say, hey, let's pull back some of the saturation and crank that up. Or we can do a hue shift and shift this, this to some other colors. And that's all set and it's all there. It's ready to go and it's live. So as long as I have that tag selected, we could, you know, we can actually feed that into materials. We do whatever we want. But if we hit play, now you can see playing back pretty dang well. We have all of those particles traveling along all of those splines and then live feeding these colors through directly onto the mesh, which we could then use to drive different materials in Redshift. And look at these colors just you know, beautifully being maintained and traveling over the entire thing. So, so many fun possibilities using this follow spline, like a very exciting combination. Now, there's actually one last thing I want to show involving this rig. Let's turn these off because I just want to look at the particles again. So letting these particles run, you can see that, yeah, we've got these colors exactly what I wanted, nice and bright and neon. But let's say that I, well, here's the effect. If we make a color mapper or a data mapper, there's a new property in there. So let's make a color mapper. And the color mapper by default is going to do something like take the age of the particle and colorize it, which is cool. Oftentimes that's exactly what you want. But something I was requesting for a really long time was the ability to essentially mix the, the property or kind of do like a feedback loop. And now we have that with this mix property. So I'm going to do the simplest possible thing. I'm going to say, hey, just give me like a single solid color. So let's say just a simple white here. And I'm going to say, I don't want to just set it to white. Before it was like, oh, he's 100%. But 
But now I could say, hey, take whatever your current value is and slowly transition. So every frame, it's turning 1% more white and slowly fading away. Let's drop this down lower, like 0.3. It'll take a little bit longer now. And we change the color. Let's crank this up to, I don't know, let's go to full on pink. And now over time, as the particles get older and older and older, as they mix, you see that everything's turning more and more pink as it goes along until we get to, you know, essentially if we push this up high enough, let's go back to one. As the particles get older, they're going to fully transition into those colors. So again, I love these types of feedback loops. It's so powerful and there's so many cool things you can do and it can get way crazier. I, I don't want to push it too far right now. But in theory, we could do things like use the field and then I could drag the particles themselves into it. And now we have the colors of the particles being what is getting fed in and then modify those colors somehow and slowly transition them to something new based on it or from other particles. The combinations get crazy. Now, you also have that same mixing property with the data mapper where we can lower the amount. So we could slowly transition between properties, but it's the exact same concept as this color mapper. And I think the color mapper kind of gives you a very good intuition of exactly what that does. But I think that is actually going to cover everything I want to talk about when it comes to the changes to these particles. But even just with a handful of little changes, I think that it's opened up a lot of really cool new opportunities. Okay, now time for the video that I always pretty much skip over. We've got import and export changes. In the USD importer, there is a new option to support instanceable prims, which I assume are instances of primitives. And then we got the USD exporter, which we can export our instances as instantiable prims. And uh, then we also have more support for exporting skeletal animations. The FBX importer, the scale settings are now defined based on the unit from the exported FBX. And the XBF exporter, the units are now defined by the project scale settings. And finally, capsules and nodes. This is the final segment, but don't skip it because there's a couple of cool new capsules that you might have a use for. So let's jump into a new scene file. And to begin with, I'll go to a node layout, which we might need, but I'm going to search for the word grid. And it's actually the very first capsule made by Rocket Lasso. If I double click on that, you're going to see, actually, I'll show you the wrong one first. Going to the old version of Cinema, if I go to box mode and let's start shrinking those a little bit, you'll see that my boxes are all open and the user had to manually go into subdivisions and say that they are now closed. So, you know, that was a manual process. But in the new version, if I click and I say I would like to go to box mode and I'd like to start shrinking them, you see that, that they are actually closed. But if I go to segment mode, that they're all properly open. Now, the reason for that is there is new settings for type and for closed spline, which are auto. So for things that are splines inside of nodes, you can now determine if they're open or closed and if, you know, what the different spline types are from internal to the capsule. And now you can still go override it. I could say, no, this should be open on the box. Let me go back to the box being a box. You can see I, I can override it and say, okay, you are open or you have to be closed but auto will now do whatever the nodes are saying to do internally, which is actually really great. That means the tools can be more automatic and a new user wouldn't be confused by what's going on. So really like that. Uh, next up, there is the spline segment. So let me search for the word segment and create that. It's a primitive we've had for a while, but the interface is now way cleaner before all these parameters used to show up. So it was kind of intimidating. But now you can just like set the length of your spline. We can change the orientation. There's a couple of little bugs that got fixed from it. So it's a nice way of making just a straight line spline, which saves a lot of time from my usual method, which is making a helix, setting the orientation, dropping these radiuses down, and then getting rid of all of those points. And then there's still three points. So the segment is probably what I'm going to start using. Now, inside of the actual nodes, we've got a couple of little things. Just like in Redshift, I can right-click and add any of those inputs. We've had that for a little while, but the interface is a lot cleaner now. And if I were to start driving multiple things, like let's say I make a math node and I say, hey, I want to connect this to input one and input two. If I tear this out, the text isn't broken. Before, it would kind of start listing all of them and override your parameter, but now it's nice and clean. In addition to that, you'll see our math node has a lovely new icon. So even if you rename it, you get this little icon showing whatever your mathematical function is. And if we make a compare, the compare will show a greater than or less than. Just a nice, clean, quick visual way of knowing exactly what your math is doing, uh, which in the past could have gotten lost really easily. 
Now, there are a couple of cool new modifiers I want to talk about. So let's go to our standard layout. And let's start out with just a, actually, I'm going to load in our old friend, the T-Rex. So I'm going to double click, load him in. But sorry, buddy, I'm going to delete out your teeth, your eyeballs, because I just need a single mesh. But, you know, you got to use a T-Rex. I'm going to search for the word set color. And now there is another node capsule, mostly to be used inside of a nodal context. But you can drag it in um, any model. And you see it automatically makes a vertex map for us. And here it's a polygon vertex map, so you get kind of these cool hard edges, but you can also say that it should be set to point mode. And now uh, when it's actually returning points, you'll see that the tag changes to a point tag. And now I don't have those hard edges anymore. So this is based on the position. It's the position of the overall thing. The bounding box is determining what color it's going to be. So you get this kind of crazy, cool, multicolored T-Rex. Could be cool artistically for like emitting particles, taking on the color. Pyro could be driving color. Now, mostly it's an internal node tool where I can do things like set an absolute color, or we can do math with these vertexes to like add a color, subtract a color. Uh, for most of our use cases, we would, you know, just use normal field transfer. But, you know, there's a way of doing it inside of nodes where we don't have fields. You can also return completely random colors, which could be cool. But of course, fields have ways of doing that anyway. Now, let's jump to a new scene file. And here's a very, very simple one. I'll make a plane and create a few subdivisions on there and search for the word noise modifier. There's a new noise modifier. Again, mostly internal for capsules. But if I were to grab this and maybe start increasing the scale, you can see we've got this noise pattern we can deform it with. Now, of course, we would usually do this using a plane effector set to deform mode, or we would do it with the displacer deformer. So I definitely recommend still using those other methods, not this one, but you don't really have access to fields or effectors in the context of nodes. So this is going to be very helpful for that type of thing. But now the fun one is going to be, let's go back to our T-Rex and we don't need the set color anymore. But what I do want is the new set points. And this one's kind of funky and I'd love to see people come up with some weird use cases for it. So set points is going to take the points, edges, or polygons and do something to them. So we got our walking T-Rex. I'm going to say, well, let's take all of his points on X and set them to exactly 100 or set them exactly to zero. And now I've flattened my T-Rex as a deformer. And I always like doing things as a deformer and like not physically scaling the model down. So that's kind of fun. There's other modes though, uh, like we could center it to the center point of where those were. But the really fun one to me is actually quantize. So I'm going to set this quantize to 100 on X and on Y and on Z. And look, we're going to get this QB looking T-Rex. Now uh, we can do some smoothing on it, perhaps. I'm going to take the entire T-Rex and feed him into a cloth surface, which will subdivide at once. And now this smoothing is kind of making it look nice and boxy. It actually kind of looks like that new Minecraft trailer a little bit. So you get this fun boxy T-Rex. So yeah, really weird, but we're quantizing the points. They are snapping to the nearest 100. So we can jump this to like 200 and kind of drop his resolution down further, or we could drop it to 55 or, you know, lower it down to 55. And now he's going to have more, but still kind of boxy. So yeah, kind of weird and fun. Um, and yeah, we can change the clip. We could probably you know, add in some smoothing here, which gets a little bit funky, but it's kind of like the transition between them. So yeah, I'd like to see people make some interesting things with that. But those are a couple of new nodal capsules that you're able to use to make some pretty cool effects. So that's going to wrap this one up. Thank you so much for watching, as always. And don't forget about that 5% discount code on the Rocket Field Driver bundle. So you get those six new fields and the actual field driver tag. Anyway, that's going to wrap this one up. Thank you so much for watching. As always, your support is super appreciated, both with Patreon and with buying our plugins. But in any case, I'll see you in the next video or live stream or tutorial. So bye-bye, everybody.